golf, like so many things in America, was an import brought here in the late 19th century by emigrating Scots. The spectacle was a strange one in a frontier society, but it took root in the East, spread to Chicago. A U.S. Golf Association was formed and an open championship started. The American golfing explosion had begun. And now they have gathered near Chicago for the diamond anniversary, the 75th U.S. Open. What began with a handful at Newport, Rhode Island in 1895 is now the world's greatest tournament. The Scots dominated first. Willie Anderson won it four times. Gene Sarazen made Knickers famous with two victories. Bobby Jones, an amateur, emphasized the word open in the tournament's title. Time moved on, and the classic swing of Byron Nelson took the crown. Ben Hogan equaled the four wins of Willie Anderson and Bob Jones. A man named Palmer made the game an obsession for Americans in the 60s. And Jack Nicklaus stamped his name in the book as perhaps the greatest of all. And now we're here at Medina for the diamond anniversary, the 75th United States Open. And the question occurs, to what golfer will this diamond be a guy's best friend? Well, fortune's favorite of the moment is the 36-year-old veteran Frank Beard. He was once one of the big names on the golf tour, but has been playing badly for three years, hitting bottom in the early months of this season. Suddenly, he has pulled his game together, and he's the leader. and Arnold Palmer. Nicholas at the moment at plus three and Arnold at plus four. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from our anchor position behind the 18th green and with me is the former PGA champion and our resident expert at ABC Sports on the game, Dave Marr. We might point out, uh, David, before we go any further, that we have a true transatlantic commentary team with us today out on the golf course. Our, our ABC colleague, uh, Keith Jackson, with the great Byron Nelson. We also have former British Ryder Cupper Peter Alice, the truly inimitable Henry Longhurst, both from England. And uh, on the fairways, former PGA champion Bob Rosberg and our colleague Bill Fleming. We've got a lot of guys out here, but we're going to cover a lot of holes. Thirteen all together is our possibilities. With 24 cameras, you probably read it. Five million dollars worth of equipment. We hope to justify it all. Well, I'm sure we will, but, uh, Jim, and this, this tournament has changed a little bit today. Though it's still quite warm, it's a lot windier than it has been. And what this will mean to the players, the greens will dry out, they'll be a little faster, and the shots they've been hitting into the greens from out of the rough, let's say, won't hold quite as well. I look for the scores to be a little higher today, and especially among the leaders. It seems that they've gotten off to a shaky start. Frank Beard hit it in the water at the second hole, but still managed to escape with a bogey four, so he escaped a little lightning right there. That showed a little grit right there. After putting it in the water, he made, in essence, a birdie on his second ball. So, well, there's you know. no question about it. You've got to do that. You've got to avoid the double bogeys when you're playing in the U.S. Open. Excuse me, look at the little fellow behind us there at 5'9", 163. Ben Crenshaw, he's coming back a little. Well, he sure is, and he's just made a birdie at the fifth hole to go back to even par for the tournament. And it seems that all week long, Ben has... Uh, uh, when he's hit a bad shot, has been able to escape it, though yesterday was not quite one of his good rounds. Uh, he still, at the last hole, made quite a forward to, to still stay in position. So he's even, and certainly by no means out of it, if he can make a couple more birdies. That's quite a combination. Ben Crenshaw at 5'9", playing with Peter Oosterhaus, the Englishman who's been playing so well at 6'5". <laughs> well, I think Ben brings the ball down court in that group. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly right. Ooster House is the forward. Ben Crenshaw, even as you see, tied for third place, two behind the leader. That's the situation at the moment. I think they are having to wait. Maybe they're about ready to go now. Well, I'm not sure what's happening, but they're playing the sixth hole, and it yep. looks like Peter's the one that's going to play first. He shot, uh, as you said yesterday, he shot 41 on the front and then came back in 31, which is uh, four under on the back nine and quite a round if you looks like you've given it away on the front. So far, he's even on today's round at plus one for the tournament. So he's very much in it, only three strokes behind the leader, Frank Beard. Boy, this is going to be something and a long way to go. Get comfortable. Well, there's so many players with a chance to win. Of course, Peter's one of them. He may not be well-known here in the States, but he's a very well-known player throughout the world. And he hit a shot there that went way left. Looked like it may have hit the chain link fence there. Boy, you know, it could have gone through there and been out of bounds. Or it could have gone over and been out of bounds. In this case, however, it hit the fence and bounced back into that longish stuff beside the green. So that's kind of a break. There is a road, a regular uh, street and highway going past there on the left. Uh, a good shot. Here's that look from behind. We really can see the problem that uh, Ben has here, or the opportunity, as the case may be. That's right. This is this handheld camera that we have that uh, I think uh, we were one of the first to use. I think BBC was actually the very first to use, but it's something that shows what the player's view is. Now you see the, the little guy from the University of Texas here, and a real nice young man, and certainly a very fine player, getting ready to hit his second shot here at this real good par four hole. As we pointed out yesterday, he came out of the University of Texas as kind of a golden boy. He's put that one, as you see, uh, just off the edge and into that longish stuff. Won his first tournament on the tour, and since then has had a lot, a lot of troubles, a lot of bad luck on the tour. It seems we've matured him because he's playing extremely well this week. Ben Crenshaw and Peter Oosterhaus on the sixth hole, remember, will be covering 13 holes as they head for the clubhouse. Stand by. We're back again at the United States Open Golf Championship, Medina Country Club outside Chicago. It's a hot day in the Midwest, not as hot as yesterday because there are some clouds overhead. A breeze has also come up, which will definitely come into play in this tournament today. And there's the way they stand. Frank Beard still one ahead of Pat Fitzsimons. They're playing together. That's going to be a tense competition. And now we're back to the trials of Peter Oosterhaus off the green at the sixth hole on this par four. He lies to the big six foot five Englishman who led the British Order of Merit for the past four years. Which means he's the best player there. That's what they go by is the Order of Merit rather than uh, the money. But the one good thing in his favor here, Jim, is he's got some green to work with to play this shot. You can see there how quick those greens are. Peter, a fine young player. This is not a fluke. He was tied for third in the 73 Masters, led after three rounds on that occasion. Now back to Ben Crenshaw, who has had rounds of 70, 68, and 76. Well, it's that third round jitters in the U.S. Open. So many of the scores went up yesterday, and you could hear something got Ben's attention there. We can take a little look at his slow motion swing here on his second shot. Now, I'm not surprised that Ben hit the ball to the right here, but he's let the club go past horizontal or past parallel. I think he's overswung just a little. Now as he gets down, he blocks the ball out to the right, and I'm sure part of that is because Oosterhaus just ahead of him and almost knocked the ball out of bounds to the left. So that definitely makes you look at that out of bounds to the left, Jim. So you chaps do that too, eh? Well, <laughs> everyone <laughs> chokes, Jim. It just depends on what degree. That roar you just heard, you might have guessed, would be Palmer and Nicholas. It was a Nicholas birdie that puts Jack to two over and only four shots out of the lead. That was it the ninth. We don't have coverage at the moment on nine. However, we'll be picking up Palmer and Nicholas on the 10th hole very shortly and follow them on in. Ooh, that's a big birdie that Nicholas just got. Yeah, but that was a pretty bad shot. Little Ben hit there. I mean, yeah. uh, it looked like his mind got off of it. He heard that roar because the green is somewhat near the ninth hole. And I think in a case like that, he was listening when he should have been paying attention to what he had in front of him. Behind him, you could see those trees blowing. You can still see them there now. Now That's about the strength of this breeze. And it's a little gusty. I think it could be a bigger problem as we go along. I don't think there's any question about that. When you're playing in among so many trees, uh, a lot of times you can't really feel the wind as strong as it is. You have to look up in the top of the trees to see how much it's blowing. For those of you who weren't with it yesterday, we would point out that Ben Crenshaw is a bridegroom-to-be. One week from today, he's going to be married in Westchester County, New York, to Polly. Well, he, with that bad shot, he'd be uh, just make a five here. wouldn't be too bad. Yeah, looks like he's going to get it pretty close. Yeah, right, he'll have that for a par four. 
He told me yesterday he's been putting so well that all he really wanted to do was just to get on the green. He felt like if he could get on the green, he could win the tournament. He birdied the fifth hole, remember, so he's one under on today's round. Booster House picked up a bogey on three, but then birdied five also, so he's even on today's round. And again, one over for the tournament, three shots behind the leader, Frank Beard, who has yet to come to this sixth hole where we're picking up coverage. You think they pronounced that Dulwich or Dulwich or? We'll get the word from Peter Alice or Amy Longhurst a little later. If you're listening out there, Peter, what is it? Uh, Dulwich or Dulwich? Or? Dulwich. Dulwich. Thank Dulwich, you. Yes. Thank you very much. I knew we'd be wrong. <laughs> well, either I don't know how to pronounce it, they don't know how to spell. I've never figured that out. Peter, now for the par four. Oh, how about that? That was delightful. Well, get a second shot it. like that and get away with a four. Well, you can tell by the smile on his face. But yes. you have to have some of those, Jim. A lot of times you'll hit good shots during a round and not make a par. So those things uh, hopefully will even out over a period of your career. Jack Nicholas, by the way, made the turn in 34. That's two under par on the front side. He is two over for the tournament. Remember, four shots out of the lead. Palmer seems to be fading, as does Trevino. And this is Crenshaw, the contender, staying two shots behind Frank Beard. At age 23, the pressure has to be tremendous. Okay, they move on to the seventh hole, and on the sixth hole, we get our first look at Lou Graham. Lou Graham, who had 68 yesterday to move into a contending position. Today is one under, is at even par, two shots out of the lead. He's been on the tour a long time, has always been consistent, has never won one of the major championships. The one thing in Lou's favor is he's a very good driver, generally. When he's playing well, he can keep the ball in play, and that is so important when you're playing a golf course like this. To man the rough with the trees, and you've got to keep it where you can find it. Well, hit. this time he's put it in the bunker. Lou Graham, 37-year-old veteran professional from Nashville, Tennessee. Again, a look at the leaderboard. Beard by one over Fitzsimons. Then Graham, the man you were just watching, put it in the bunker. Crenshaw. As we said, we have a transatlantic team of announcers. Why don't we check in with some of them and see who they are? Well, Jim, contentious literati might have us believe that poets were the first to deal with state of mind, but they never played golf. Certainly not in the final round of the U.S. Open, for this is the day when putters turn into ropes Fades don't fade and hooks don't hook. This, of all days, of all places and all times, is the day when a man must play within himself. And a man who has tasted the wine of that well of pressure many times, sitting here with me, Mr. Byron Nelson. And Byron, this is a tough day for a player. It certainly is, Keith. And you know, yesterday I was really disappointed and surprised that the scores were so high. Today I'm going to be surprised if the scores are not better if the boys can keep their nerve and their thoughts right on the greens. The pins are cut very uh, easily, actually, for the USGA Open. They're putting the center back, but you must have your courage. You must keep your thoughts about being able to knock the ball to the back of the green. And the greens are putting very keen today, faster than any other day. So they're going to have to do that thinking that you're talking about today if they're going to win. Now, let's spend a moment with Mr. Henry Longhurst. Well, we're seeing a lot of new and newish names here at the top in this championship this year. And I can't help feeling that it's the beginning of a new era. Now, I'm not such a fool as to suggest that Nicholas is past it or anything like that, but there does come a limit to the number of major tournaments a man can win when he's won them all before. And also when he is, if I may be forgiven for saying so, a most intelligent man and has other interests like creating golf courses all over the world. And so I think this may be the dawn of a new era, lots of new names, and perhaps I may be forgiven for mentioning my fellow countryman, Peter Oosterhuis, who has a wonderful short game, is only four, four strokes off the lead, but has one weakness, and that is that at six foot five, he can occasionally slice one ball so majestically and so far off the line that men simply don't believe it can be true. Now, if he can avoid that, he might well be one of those who come right up to the top. We shall see, but I believe that history is going to be changed here at Medina this week. And now I pass it to my friend and colleague of the BBC in London, Peter Ellis, 
who has played in nine Ryder Cup matches and beaten Palmer in his prime level in America and halved with him in England, Peter Ellis. For the spectators out here at Medina and uh, all you at home, this could really be a very passionate day's golf. Although it's no detriment to them, and I hope they won't take it as such, the names at the top of the pile at this moment are perhaps not the most familiar amongst uh, golfers in America. The Millers, the Palmers, the Nicholases, the players are slightly down the field. So for someone, unless there's a big tie tonight, three or four, having to battle it out again tomorrow, there is going to be a great deal of happiness for one and a lot of sadness for a few. And uh, whilst we watch these great shots being played, let's temper it with a little bit of sympathy because some dreams are going to disappear on these green fairways and wonderful uh, conditions here at Medina. It's going to be a great day. I hope you enjoy it as we go out to live golf. And Lou Graham coming out of the bunker on the sixth hole. This is his third shot, remember? It's not too bad a shot there. It's just straight downhill, that part of the green that he landed on. And as we pointed out there, the wind is blowing and it dried out a little bit since yesterday. And they're really quick, Jim, going down those hills. Or but he'll have to make level. He'll have to make that putt to remain two shots off the lead at even par. He's had two birdies today and one bogey. Birdied the first and the fourth. Bogeyed the second, which is a par three that has given a lot of trouble. Tenth fairway, here is Jack Nicholas. Can it be that he has begun the move? Nicholas on the front, as we said, turned in 34, that's two under par, and has birdied the hole he just played the ninth. This is a par five that you cannot reach in two, but Jack has hit it in an ideal spot there to the right. It's 583 yards long with an out-of-bounds to the left. There's a highway there, even. Yep. A lot of highways surrounding the Medina Country Club, and you're aware of it all the time you're playing. Okay. Oh! He made a long grass. Yeah, he hit that, I'm sure, a little farther than he wanted to, because he got to keep it in the fairway there to get be sure you get a good line for your next shot. And yet he just about couldn't reach the green, so he's put himself in that long grass instead of on the place where, where they've mowed it especially. That's right. Now back to Luke Graham, who needs this for the par on the sixth hole. Graham this year has had four top ten finishes in 17 starts. He's been fourth in three different tournaments, the Crosby, the Hawaii, and Greater Jacksonville. He's a good, steady player, but he needs to make this putt. And he did. Oh, boy. He's always been a fine putter, hasn't he? Well, I think anybody's name that you've ever read has been a good putter at one time or another. I think some are more consistent than others, but if you can't putt, James, you may as well stay at home. Okay, Lou Graham, who in 11 years on the tour, 10 and a half years, say, has had two victories. That's not unusual. He's... Now, on the 10th fairway, we have stationed our ABC colleague, Bill Fleming. What do you see out there, Bill? Well, Jim, I am on 10 right now because that's where Nicholas and Palmer are. I have been following them very uh, much since the first hole today, as have some 10 or 12,000 fans who were simply delighted at the pairing. However, Palmer and Nicholas themselves were not too happy with it. They don't like to play uh, against each other because uh, they know that they are very competitive and they had to play that third round of the Masters, you recall, and they shot 74-75. But the way things have gone on this front nine, as you know, Nicholas had a 34, which is two under par, but Arnold has been quite erratic and finished one over par at 37. They both started even at 217, plus four, but right now Jack Nicholas is two over, and he is only four shots off the lead. Now, as far as they stand on this particular hole, Jack is up in front of the green in the long grass in two, but Arnold Palmer is about 165 yards down this fairway in the deep rough on the left side. It's kind of interesting to note that Arnie has uh, been hooking his drives into the deep woods and has been making some absolutely re remarkable recovery shots, hitting trees but getting back out. And I think on the ninth green, he sank about a 15-footer to save par where Jack got his birdie from about 10 feet. So Jack is the more consistent of these two today, and Arnold's still in there trying. And, of course, everybody has been uh, cheering both of them on tremendously. Arnold Palmer with 37 on the front nine and Jack Nicholas with a two under par, 34. And you can hear the applause now as Nicholas comes up. And uh, the, the thing that's kind of interesting about it is that Jack gets a, a fine, sustained round of applause. Arnold gets that, but in addition, he gets that, that animalistic kind of shouting, go Arnie! It's a, it's a strange thing to watch. Every time he hits a shot, it's like a touchdown on the Rose Bowl game. 
Okay, Jim, I believe now you can see Arnold walking back to his ball. I can tell you it's about 165 yards from the green in the deep well. Well, right now we have been watching Jack Nicklaus coming up to his shot. Looks to me, David, like he must have gone 550 yards in two shots, and, and that averages out to 275 a poke. Well, he... <laughs> In two shots, uh, you hear about people that are long drivers and so forth, but in two shots, Jack Nicklaus can cover just about as much real estate as anyone. You see the previous rounds for Arnold started out with 69, went to 75, then brought it down to 73 yesterday. But on today's round, as Bill said, he's had trouble. He won over on the front, but nine holes to go. This is his third shot on this par five. And he's got some trouble here because that ball looks like it's out of sight down in that deep rough. And he didn't like it. Nope. The usual aggressive approach by Palmer, and you, you see where it is. And if he'd put it much further left, he would have been up to against that road again. Let's go out on the fairway on the sixth hole where Pat Fitzsimons is in trouble. Let's go to the former PGA champion, Bob Rosberg. What's the situation there, Bob? This is the first drive that Fitzsimons has hit offline all day. He's just played five beautiful holes, uh, made a birdie at the first hole. He hooked his drive here at number six and knocked the ball into the deep rough to the left. Uh, I think that he's going to have a full swing. He's very close to the fence, taking out a medium iron. I doubt it very much if he'll be able to get to the green from here. That is trouble. Bob uh, Beard must have shown a little determination on two when he put the ball in the water and still managed a four on the far three hole. Well, it's very odd to say, but I think that uh, the second hole may have turned the tide for Frank. Okay. How about Frank's drive there at uh, six, Bob? Is he in good shape? Frank is perfect. Uh, Fitzsimons has just come out very badly, yep. well short of the green in the right-hand rough. Uh, we see it. Frank has seemed to uh, go back to his strength. He's aiming everything way right, hitting big hooks, but very strong. And he's only missed one fairway. He hit it fat at the second hole, but made about a 20-footer for a four. When you said the turning point, you meant favorably for Frank, right? Not the other way around? Well, there's no question about that. Yeah, but I mean, he, he did make bogey, but he pulled it out beautifully. Well, he didn't like that. Well, it's that, that hook started left, and when you start your hook left, it's not generally going to catch the green. He's over there about where Peter Oosterhaus was. True, you saw where it ended up. Peter, of course, hit the fence and bounded back that far. Frank's ball just rode in. Okay, take a little look here at Frank's swing. Uh, I think the thing you want to watch here is Frank's left hip. Uh, we can't quite see it from this angle, but I think you'll see that he turns his hips out of the way a little more quickly than he means to. And makes a pretty good turn back. Now as he starts down, he doesn't move down the line toward his target, but he takes his left hip straight back. Now he's out of position there. The ball gets away from him. It starts to the left of the flag when, as Bob said, he's been starting everything out to the right. The ball needed to start down the, the real heavy rough down to the right in order to play a hook in there. And now... The man from Pennsylvania in trouble. We have seen that so many times through the years. And on many occasions, we've seen him come out of it somewhat miraculously. Nicholas is already on the green in three. Just kept running. There's not much room in the back of that green. It's just a little neck back there. That's where the flag is. Uh, you, you get to the side of it, and you're not going to get the ball very close to hold. Crowd today, I'm sure, although the official attendance is not in yet, will be an open record. And there was no question before the day began they would break the record for the total tournament attendance. Everybody in Illinois seems to be out here, and a good proportion of them around these men, as always, despite the fact that Nicholas is still four shots off the lead, and Palmer is seven out. Nicholas will have a chance for a bird on this sixth hole. There are some of the people of Chicago. Okay, go ahead. Take a wave. <laughs> now Pat Fitzsimons with his third shot on the par four sixth hole. He's had many opportunities to shake and cave in in this tournament, but each time he's been in trouble, he's come back again. And he's on the green now. We'll at least have him the opportunity of running it up for a possible par. Pat Fitzsimons from Oregon won the Glen Campbell Los Angeles Open this year. Before that was little known to the general public. After all, he only won $10,000 last year. And now Frank Beard, one shot over the man he's playing with. Remember, these are the two leaders playing together. Lou Graham, whom you saw, just behind them. 
I think the thing you've got to watch here, Jim, is for Frank not to worry about Pat so much. He's got to play his own game for a while. Now, it looks like if Frank can get down in two from where he is, he's going to have a two-shot lead over Pat. Well, that's the temptation you have. I think you have to concentrate and worry about your own game till you get close to home. There's that $2,500 he's earned so far this year. Well, better than $1,900 of that he earned last week in Philadelphia. So before that, he had earned about $500 for the entire season up into the, the month of June for the man who is the 11th leading money winner of all time. That is a disastrous thing. It's enough really to end a man's career in this game to totally destroy his confidence. But here yeah, he is. So much of it is confidence. And from the way he talked this morning, he's, uh, you know, he wasn't excited about it. He just feels like he's in good position to win and certainly is not going to. I don't know whether he I don't know whether he was bothered by the jet overhead or somebody taking a picture outside the fence. I think it might have been that. You can hear the traffic pattern from O'Hare International Airport. <laughs> it's what we call rail birds, I think. They didn't pay their way in, but uh, maybe he played that a little quicker. I can't tell whether he got set there. Of course, you can get your mind off of it. Those people did say something to him. I don't know this exactly is, what went on. This is very significant play we're watching right now because both of the leaders are in trouble and this could bring them back to the rest. Back to, for example, this man, Jack Nicholas, now putting for a birdie. Jack very colorfully attired today. This was what could amount to a two-shot swing, Jim, because if he birdies and they bogey... That's it. It's kind of like full games in baseball, you know? If somebody's two shots behind, it's kind of like one full shot, you know? One for him and one, one against me. the other fellow. <laughs> yeah. That should break a little bit from left to right, I believe, and so good. let it go. That's it. Right. So a par five for Jack Nicholas keeps him at plus two for the tournament. Two under on today's round, however. Still has eight holes to go. Four shots out of the lead, but it could be three very shortly. Now here's Fitzsimons again, who started this tournament extremely well and has been steady all the way through. Today started off with a birdie has part everything since, but now faces a bogey unless he makes this long putt. Well, unless the camera angle got me, I think it's Frank Beard that's out first. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. Frank, Frank has definitely a longer putt, it looked like, from yep. our angles. Yeah. Yep. Frank is, in fact, away. He's had rounds of 74, 69, and 67, descending every day. Strong point of Frank's game, uh, I think, has been his putting for a while. Uh, if you can say a man has had so much trouble as Frank, but he does have a beautiful putting stroke, and when he gets it going, he can really run the table. Did you hear all that traffic? You hear the horns blowing just then? You hear the jets overhead? It really is quite distracting today. I think the wind must be blowing the noise in a little more from the road. Lest you think uh, nobody's interested in following these leaders, this is the furthest point from the clubhouse, so less of the crowd would tend to be out there. Now to the 11th hole. Keith Jackson will be reporting from there. Jack Nicholas is on the tee. Jack, uh, Jack Nicholas is hitting a one iron. The wind is at his back. If he draws it a little bit, he can get enormous distance out of the one iron. If he hits it straight and deep, he can knock it through the fairway. It's about a 400-yard hole. It is a birdie opportunity for Jack Nicklaus, and he is in perfect posture to approach to the green. That is a long one iron, Byron. Well, he hits a long iron almost as far as most people hit a driver. He really can hit a long ways. Pat Fitzsimons. On the sixth, this long putt for a par. And with that, an opportunity to pick, uh, go into a tie. That's right. Good oh my putt. God. Oh, what a beautiful putt. Oof. Just spinning off the left side there, a hair too strong, or he would have gotten into a tie for the lead. All right, things are just tightening up minute by minute here. But Simons and Beard going on to the seventh hole. We're going to go to a commercial, and we'll be right back. Again, we return to the U.S. Open Golf Championship. Look how very close it is. Beard by one over Fitzsimons and Lou Graham by two over the... Action on the course with Lou Graham. Keith? Lou Graham has been a very steady, steady, steady performer throughout this 
United States Open Golf Championship. I'm quiet because Hale Irwin, his wife below me, taps in to make a quite a remarkable par. And here is Lou Graham now on seven going for a birdie on this long 590-yard par five. He's got to come up over a crown. He has good roll on the ball, but when it got to the crown, it took the steam out of it and left himself considerably short. So instead of considering birdie, now he must consider saving par. Meantime, let's go to the 11th fairway as Arnold Palmer is preparing to hit his second shot. Arnie, hitting a wedge at about 125, 26 yards to this green. And the pin placement on this particular hole today is quite easy in contrast to some of the other holes. Yes, uh, Keith, it's a peculiar thing. Look at the beautiful gallery ring around this uh, hole. If your ball lands the front part of the green, which actually looks like it's on a little slope, the ball stops. If it lands clear back to the back part of the green where the pin is, the ball bounces over. So I'm sure that uh, Jack will try to land beyond where Arnie's ball stops so quickly. Jack Nicholas at two over par for the tournament. And three shots off the lead. Arnold Palmer is now six over. Jack is hitting a wedge. Could be a sand wedge because the wind is at their back and he wants the bite. He'd like to carry it as deep as he can, but when you get up in the neighborhood of the pin, it gets very difficult, as Byron just noted. Has it high, has it to the golfer's right side, has it in the middle of the green, comes up, sits. There's a birdie possibility of 18 feet. For him, Arnold will be stroking his butt from around 30 feet. Jack put this downhill slightly and break a little bit to his left, Keith, and it's fast, but he knows that by now. Over on the seventh green, one of the more difficult greens, I think, to putt because of the places they can hide the pin, and it looked like they gave them a little more room today, and from where Lou Graham is hitting, he'll get a slight break and should be left-right. Boy, if he keeps rolling those in like that, Keith, he's really going to be hard because he hits it so straight. That's right. So Lou Graham remains even far for the tournament as he completes the seventh hole. And the roar goes up from the 11th as Palmer and Nicholas come walking onto the green. It was Keith, while they're, excuse me, while they're coming up, some may be wondering what's happened to Johnny Miller looking at Nicholas here. Johnny Miller had a strange round today. He went out in 32, came back in 41 for 73s in the clubhouse at plus 12. Not a factor in this year's Open. Now here we come to the short eighth, a long short hole of 205, Ben Crenshaw there. And this is for a birdie, rather optimistic at that length, to say that. But he's been playing very much in control of himself in this situation, and, uh, well, you can't do much better than that, can you? And so that's an absolutely perfect three. And you needn't worry, my dear man, that's very good. You needn't worry if you put him that close. And now, Keith. Seventh fairway, Frank Beard. The 7,032-yard par 71 golf course is not forgiving. Certainly not on a day like this. His second shot on the par five struck with an iron to carry him down to the top of the hill so that he'll have a, a wedge shot into the green. Don't want to get it too deep. Don't want to get too hungry. We have to depend on the wedge shot. So he's just uh, in the left rough. So he will be hitting his third shot out of the left rough. Meantime, on the 11th green, Arnold Palmer's birdie try from some 32 feet. It'll go a little bit right left. Very slick little green. Starts uphill, so they get right in the hole, though. It looks mighty good. Looks mighty good. Oh, goodness sakes. <laughs> Seventh fairway, Pat Fitzsimons of Salem, Oregon. Swings through it, coming out of the rough. Looks like a student or something rather than a golfer, Pat Fitzsimons does. <laughs> yes, he does. But he sure doesn't play like one. He's steady. Staying swings very good. Left side fairway for Pat Fitzsimons as he walks to his third shot. Very much a factor. He's even par. One shot behind Frank Beard. Back to Arnold Palmer. Par putt, 11. It's about 20 inches. Arnold Palmer makes four at 11 to remain six over par for the 75th United States Open Golf Championship. 
put together brilliantly by the United States Golf Association. Now we'll be looking at a birdie putt by Jack Nicholas, and I'll call it 18 feet. I'll settle for that, Keith. And I know what Jack would settle for would be a three. <laughs> yeah, a loud plunk when the stroke is done. It's a, uh, one of those putts, Keith, as we call speed putts. If he hits it firm, it'll stay right on the right side. If it dies a little bit, it'll turn right into the hole to his left as it rolls down to the hole. If he makes this, he will go to plus one for the tournament and be only two shots off the lead. He'll take his time. Keith, uh, some people may be wondering about Tom Watson. We haven't seen him yet. He's having more bad luck. He bogeyed the second hole and the fourth and double bogeyed the sixth. He is four over on today's round, four over for the tournament. Hale Irwin, who became a factor earlier in the day, has also succumbed to some of the pressure, perhaps, and certainly some of the wilderness that exists here. He's gone to four over par. Ben Crenshaw remains very much in it, but here's the man that so many are watching, thousands of them marching through the forest here at Medina following him, and Keith gets uh, very quiet. I've, I've noticed that a lot of Jack's putts up until today, he hasn't kept his putter low. He must, being he's putting, going under part of day, he must be keeping the putter low through as he goes through, which is what you must do to roll the ball on slick, fast green. Birdie putts on its way. It's too tender. Leaves it short. So he'll tap in 10 inches for par 4 at 11 and remain two over for the tournament. And three shots behind the leader, Frank Beer. The wind continues to gust as we look at Pat Fitzsimons now on seven, third shot. Long par 5. Yes, and it's quite a bit back of that bunker, though. The bridge right. a bit deceived. He's got a lot of room there, Keith. The green, the pin looks close, but he has plenty of room on the green to uh, stop the ball. But uh, as you saw, it had to leak a little bit off the right. It's easy to uh, to do that because you want to be sure you get over the bunker. You know if you're going to leave, hit under it and leave it in the bunker, then you've got a good chance to make six or seven because that's a deep bunker. And now Frank has somewhat of the same type of shot to negotiate. He has to... I'm sure you play a pitching wedge or maybe a sand iron and just let the ball drop up over these two bunkers. Actually, I think, Byron, here you might be a little better off if you went a little beyond the pin with some good bite on it because it might come back. You're kind of going into a bank. If you just go over the bunker, it's going to get a lot of roll on it. Yes, you could. Certainly could. He has, he has about 30 feet to work with. It looks, though, from the camera position that the ball, the pin is right from the edge of the green. But he, he played a wide open, hard, uh, what we call it, just a drop shot, and he hit it quite a bit clear well clear off the green the back right edge so frank beard is not through at all on seven is he and out the hp short hole 205 yards lou graham a very likely winner i think just one behind at the moment level level second with fit silent but the moment you say somebody's a likely winner, they play a shot like that. He's way over to the right at this long short hole. 205 yards. And now we go to Peter Alice on the 12th tee. And on the 12th tee, Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer. Nicholas, with those two putts you just saw, two reasonably short putts that uh, winners have got to hold usually. Had two chances, missed them both. This is the 12th, the model of the 12th. It looks a pretty innocuous hole. The bunker on the left comes into play from the tee, but it's the trees up on the top left now at 11 o'clock as we go to the green. There's a major problem. If you finish on the fairway, anything sort of left of center, those trees come into play. Uh, Nicholas, I know, will be using a driver. This hole's only 384 yards, but already from uh, the last 15 or 16 matches or so where the cream of this field are playing, there have been five or six bogeys on this hole and only one birdie. So it has a lot of hidden terrors. Just watch him give this a bit of stick there. And whoosh. Really, really I'm only worried about the bunker on the left. Doesn't want to go left, and he has gone left. And that's left him an awkward one. Frank Beards, fourth shot. 
on number seven, the par five, and he leaves himself a considerable putt of about five feet, but it'll be relatively flat from that particular point on the green. It sure is fast, though, Keith, because I was looking at that earlier. And it, it, back on the 12th, there is a man that also has been known to give it a bit of a swoosh. Go on, my beauty. <laughs> and that's what endears him to us all, I suppose. He goes up there and he gives it the most tremendous lash. He's put it in the trees this time and left themselves two very awkward second shots for this 12th green. We'll go to Bill Fleming, who will tell us more about the uh, Palmer Drive. All right, that, uh, that drive, Peter, went right in the rough. It's uh, in the uh, sand trap. It's about a yard in, and so he's uh, not in too good a shape. Jack is in the deep rough, but a good 40 yards ahead of Palmer. Okay, back to you. Keith? At Fitzsimons, back on the seventh green. His fourth shot. A putt. That will go downhill, settle into a relatively flat part of the green from about 25 feet away. Whoa. Oh, is right. That's his slick up there. And he has a little... Some of these little sharp ones around here, these greens getting this fast, and at this stage of the game are becoming uh, what we call knee knockers. They get very scary. Can't take that putter back very far. Just barely tap it. And it's at this point where the man must reach inside of himself for discipline. Because Frank Beard is looking at a five-footer, and Fitzsimons is going to be looking at something akin to a four-footer on this slick green. I'd say, Keith, that this is a very important front putt for Frank for this entire tournament. Of course, he, as has been said, he hasn't been playing very well, and he hasn't been striking the ball quite well the last few holds. And if he takes another bogey here, it's going to hurt what little confidence he has. On the eighth hole, on the left side of your picture, Lou Graham, uh, who is even in the tournament, putting for a par. And it's a putt of uh, considerable distance uh, from where we see it, about 16 feet. So Lou Graham may be about to get into the plus column. Meantime, Frank Beard trying to save par at seven. Graham's putt's on its way on eight, and it's on the top of the hole, missing. Beard misses low side, so Frank Beard makes bogey at seven. That will drop him back to even par and into a tie with Pat Fitzsimons. Of course, Fitzsimons must himself drop a four-footer. And as we have it, that would put Lou Graham at plus one if that was a bogey at eight. Keith has now worked back. There's no one under par anymore. Everybody's back to par or more. Someone no. has said a number of times, anybody the first man in with 284, which is par for this uh, over 7,000-yard golf course uh, will be the winner. Well, there's no red on the school board, and it was suggested last night that by the time we reached the leadership, reached the halfway point today, we probably would have no red showing, meaning under par, and as of this moment, we don't. And of course, gentlemen, Mr. Nicholas is now two shots That's right. out of the lead. That Simons makes bogey as he three putts on seven, most treacherous. Hold a putt. So both Frank Beard and Pat Fitzsimons make bogey at seven as you watch the United States Open Golf Championship from Medina. Pat Nicholas, second shot at the 12th. Out of heavy rough. It's not a long shot. Hit it hard with the nine iron. He's done well. Carried it onto the green. And he ate the key, yeah. Fitzsimons, Nicholas back, stealing up on them like an old pike coming out of the rushes that the first one of these that really pulls himself together may be the winner. And that's right in the center of the group. And let's look back and see what Fitz Simon did. There it is, square down a little. Beautiful shot. All right, Henry, here is that leaderboard again. Beard at even par. One shot ahead of Ben Crenshaw, Lou Graham, and Pat Fitzsimons. Peter Oosterhaus also in that group. Jack Nicholas, two shots behind. And, of course, you saw he is safely on the green on his current hole. So we have two, four, we have at least those six men battling for the lead. You have John Mahaffey at plus three now. He's just picked up a birdie. So 
It could be about eight or nine people. Before this day is done, we'll have a shot at it. Let's go now to the ninth green. And on the ninth green, Peter Oosterhaus. A good par four, the ninth, 435 yards. Booster has had a remarkable golfing uh, well, professional life. He's, uh, well, he's now 27, so he's no longer quite so young, but the last three or four years, he's headed our Harry Varden Trophy, Order of Merit, money winners list, almost call it what you will. He's been very, very consistent indeed. And the, one of the reasons is, well, should have gone another inch, and I, that would have uh, summed it up. He gets a bit cross with himself, and strangely enough, that doesn't seem to bother him. He can be very bad-tempered, but he can switch it off again very, very quickly. It looks as if he's dropped a stroke to par there. Let's hope the head doesn't fly off the putter, otherwise things might go from bad to worse. Peter, I think that's what happens in a major championship. You, 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 you tend to get too excited or more excited than you normally would. I know I felt that way. I don't know if you did. Yes, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? It's not always the great shots that win tournaments. It's the bad ones that uh, lose it. And it's the man, really, at the end of the day who hits the least bad shots that usually wins. It's, in my experience, some of the greatest players in the world have been rather dull to watch. They sort of knock it down the fairway, knock it on the green, putt fairly steadily. And they, they're so good, they appear to be dull at times but, uh, because they're so consistent. I've never seen Oosterhaus that angry before. My goodness, he's a big man. He could be dangerous out there. Well, I think it's the pressure of, of winning the U.S. Open. I think everybody gets a little more tense this week. And here's the eighth tee. Beard. Eighth green. Uh, is he losing his grip on himself? Well, it's just the sort of thing you do. Pray that you're not going to leave yourself. And just two or three of them, and you're done. This is the ninth again. There's Lou Graham, who's putting together a very steady round. As my colleagues have said, he's uh, been a regular performer on the tour here for some years. He's won events. He's uh, made a steady income, and he keeps hitting them into the greens like that and not dropping too many shots. And they're all dropping back to him, and uh, who knows? It only needs a, a putt here or a missed shot there, and all of a sudden we look as if we might have the winner coming in. This is the 12th, though, and Nicholas, after driving in the rough and getting a good second shot from heavy grass, is on the green. This 12th, it looks so simple, but the, the green has very deceptive slopes on it. He's putting up the green. Both of these putts are for birdies. This is Fitzsimons on the left, and there you see him. He was almost beginning to move before he hit that putt, rather like he did on the last hole. And this is what we meant by the day sometimes being sad for some. Sit afterwards and wonder how you could have been so silly to drop shots. Nicholas on the right, though, the danger man, if he can keep plodding away, but he needs a couple of putts. Beard on the left, Nicholas on the right, and Beard desperately needs to hold this one, and needs to hold it confidently. That may not um, sound a very sensible thing to say, but it really would do him the world of good to get the ball having it rolling straight out of the middle of the putter and nicely into the hole. Peter? Peter? Hello. This is Byron. Hello, Byron. You know, the thing that is Nicholas's favor, I think. He's playing so much ahead of these fellows. They still have some difficult holes to play to still only be two over par by the time they get to the position where he is. Indeed. <laughs> Frank Beard had just bogeyed. Now the plus one on the top of the leaderboard. You know, it's interesting looking at the leaders, how few birdies there are among them. Fitzsimons had a birdie on one, Luke Graham had a birdie on one and four, Oosterhaus had one on the fifth hole, Crenshaw on the fifth hole, 
and Nicholas had three. Aside from that, those are the only birdies among the leaders. Well, it just shows you the pressure, and the more the tournament goes on, Jim, you realize that the 286 that Dr. Middlecoff shot in 1949 was not too bad a score. That would be two over par, of course, and you see a four-way tie for the lead at plus one right now. That means Mahaffey, we'll be seeing him after a while because he's at plus three. If he picks up another shot, he'll be getting into this. And we have Hale Irwin at plus four, Hubie Green at plus four, Bob Murphy has gotten into it at plus four. All right, Peter. Well, this is Lou Graham, and if he can hold this one, he'll be jumping about in front as well. Interesting how he bends his left elbow, almost sort of Leo Deagle fashion for our older viewers who remember him. Left elbow sort of out, pointing at the hole. Gives it a tap. Well, that was never, never on the line. It was a good speed, but it never really frightened the hole. But a comfortable par. Interesting that all these fellows are tied for the lead and they all look miserable. Because yeah, <laughs> they're not happy with the way they're playing. Keep making bogeys and make you happy, Jim, whether you're tired or not. Nicholas for a par at the 12th. Pressure right back on him now. Mustn't drop a shot here. be back in a few moments with more birdies and hopefully not too many bogeys after this message. Again a reminder about Tom Watson. He made the turn in 41. He's at five over. Jack Nicholas was playing a practice round here last week. We filmed him as he observed this very hole. Here's what he had to say. You know, and look what I've got left. I mean, you know, three wood. Uh, this is about as close as you really can cut it to be realistic and about the right position. And I've got 200 yards to the front edge of the green, 210, you know, to the center. I'm 20 yards short of really the mark I've used up here, this big oak tree. And uh, to get it up that far, you've really got to be turning it over the corner, taking a chance on the left side of the throw, which are blocked by all these trees. And then, of course, you know, I hit three or four balls back off the tee, and I only, this is the only one I kept in the fairway. All the other ones went through the fairway in the rough. This has got to be the toughest hole in the golf course. And then, of course, you got a green up here. Now, now I'm 210 yards uh, crosswind. I'm going to throw a, I'm going to try to throw a three iron and hit it hard rather than trying to hit a two iron, which is probably the right club. And to stop it on a green, huh. good luck. Smallest green on the course. Yeah, smallest green on the golf course. Probably the hardest as far as firmness. Elevation makes it tougher to stop it on. Bank in front of it and hard rough behind with a lot of slope. Outside of that, it's a very easy hole. <laughs> <laughs> that was Jack talking last week during a practice round, but he was at almost the exact spot where he is now on this 13th hole. Really sound like you can't get there from here. Okay, Bill Fleming's down on that fairway with Jack. How's it look, uh, Bill? Uh, Jim, it looks for, actually pretty good for being in the rough. He is not in the very deep rough. He's in what they call the collar, so he's only in about two inch rough, but he is about 200 yards from the green, and I'm sure that he has taken out that three iron. It might be, we'll take a check on exactly what club it is because I can't get closer to him, but it's kind of interesting to note until about five minutes ago, Jack did not know exactly how close he was in contention. Coming off that 12th uh, green, he heard me say to a newspaper man, there were four men at plus one. He said, you mean I'm only one behind? I said, that's right. He blew on his hands, took out the three wood, and that's where he put it. Well, if that doesn't excite him, nothing will. I tell you. I guess it is time to at least mention that only three men have ever won the United States Open four times. Willie Anderson, Bobby Jones, and Ben Hogan. Should Jack Nicklaus pull it out with shots like that, and that's a great shot, he would join them among the true greats of this game. Not that he hasn't by his play already. Yeah, he's had a pretty good record, I'd say, Jim. Yes. Without, uh, fear of crawling out on a limb. Okay, Peter, how about the travails of Frank Beard? Well, he needs to... Uh have a little inspiration or take a tablet or do something very soon because uh, he's had a pretty miserable last 45 minutes or so but this is for a birdie 
Not too far away, you can see he's just off the actual putting surface. About 14 paces, I suppose, from the hole. Missed a couple of short putts in the last three holes. Now, ah, needs a good strike. Come on, my beauty, come on. Needed that, that would have uh, perhaps brought a smile to his face if that had gone in. But at least it's a, a solid par four. But they're whittling away, but he's still there. And really, if he can just collect his thoughts and think, well, what would he have given last week to have been in this position with nine holes to play? The answer is he would have given a lot. So if you just pull yourself together and have a few deep breaths and just keep hitting the fairways. And it's a question now of the one who makes the fewest mistakes will be the champion. Peter, the dramatic possibilities here, of course, are so endless and varied. Fitzsimons here, an unknown a year ago. Beer trying to come back from this terrible, wretched streak he's had. Crenshaw at age 23 trying to fulfill the golden boy. Appalachian, Lou Graham, who's never won a major. This is for a par, and that mm. slips by, so Fitzsimons is just gradually pushing himself out of contention. He's missed a couple of short putts, also in the last three or four holes. Now goes to two over, but again, he's in no worse a shape than a lot. All right, here we have Peter Oosterhaus over and behind. Off the green on the 10th hole. It's a par five hole. This will be his fourth shot. He must get this close. I see little hope for him to get it very close unless he just plays a miraculous shot here. He evidently is in the tall rough because the practice swing looked like he was going to play sort of an explosion shot. And Jim, that is as well as it can be played right here. Super shot. Lovely by Peter Oosterhaus. You'll see no club being banged into the ground on that one. He can get that putt down, remember. He'll have a par and remain one out of the lead. It is Beard, Crenshaw, and Graham, one shot ahead of Nicholas, Fitzsimons, and Oosterhaus. And Nicholas now with that great second shot to this par four. Dog leg left long, 13th hole. One behind the leaders. Just thirsting for that fourth U.S. Open championship. And not only that, Jim, you know he's got to be thinking about uh, he hasn't played all that well this week, but if he could possibly win the tournament here, he's played well at Carnoustie in the past, and certainly at Firestone, where we're going to be playing the PGA. Uh, he would at least have half of the two of the four legs on the Grand Slam, professional Grand Slam. There's Ben Crenshaw with a birdie putt on the left of your screen, Jack Nicholas on the right. Crenshaw, remember, is at plus one, tied for the lead make this to go into the lead. If there is a playoff, it will be tomorrow at 18 holes, and we will be here. Crenshaw did not make his, as you saw. Jack always taking a little longer to line it up. Where's the hole? Yeah, well, you saw what he has left. Not too, too big a putt left. He should be able to make the par four to remain at plus two. I mentioned the consistency earlier of this man, Dave. Nicholas, just all week long. Every time you look, he's steady, steady, steady as the others slide back. Well, it, but this thing is bothering me a little bit, and I'm sure bothering him. He's left it short uh, there at 11, 12, and 13. He's got to be a little bit bolder. You've got of course, don't want to go crazy, but you've got to be a little bolder than that. Now the man who's trying to prove that a British golfer, since Tony Jacklin, can join the American Tour and make himself a power, Peter Oosterhaus needs this for a par on the 10th hole. That should go a little left to right, but not out of the hole. It's going to be a bogey six that will put him at plus three. By the way, not one of the leaders except Jack Nicklaus has been able to play the front nine in under par. Nicholas had 34. Everybody else has been par or over. And it gives you an idea of the pressure of the U.S. Open. Again, the three-way tie for the lead now. Beard, Crenshaw, and Graham, 23 years old, in between 36 and 37 years old. Jack Nicholas at 35, Fitz Simons at 24. The generation gap has drawn together. This is 
This is no gimme putt here, Jim. He's got to be very careful. This is, he's got to keep his mind on it, keep it in the hole. Don't get it outside the hole on any of these short little putts here. All right. Got it. He has nerves of steel. He can just hit that thing so solid and he just runs right into the center of the hole. How still his body remain on that putt, just as if it were a statue, only the, the hands and the arms moving together. On the 11th tee, young Ben Crenshaw. With a three wood in his hand on this 400 yard par four mile dog leg left. Ben Crenshaw working for his master's degree in scrambling this week. Of course, I'd Arnold say Palmer is the doctor. Wouldn't you? <laughs> he should have received his degree. Got to be careful. Don't hit it too far to the road. Don't hit it too far either way. But generally speaking, the tendency has been to keep it on the right side. And if you hit it too firm, you knock it on through the short grass and into the rough. And it's hard to make four there. I never did see it. I got a sneaking suspicion he went left. He did go left. Had some reaction to a hook. But uh, now I'm told it is in proper position. Here's Peter Oosterhaus on 11. Playing with Ben Crenshaw. Big tall man, doesn't take the club too far back. Can hit it a long way. Going with the three wood, choosing not to go for the driver. If you really jumped on a driver, you could knock it down over the corner. So they're in the rough. Ben Crenshaw in the right, and uh, Peter Oosterhaus on the left. And it's Oosterhaus who will have the greater problem. Now let's go to 14. Uh, the 14th tee, the shortest hole on the course, 167 yards. I don't need to tell you who that is. And he's taking seven hours, but he's six over. And that's right in the very center of the hole, of uh, the flare, the green, come on. And it's about uh, 10 paces from the hole for Arnold Palmer. But, of course, it's Nicholas that we're really looking at. And he has one great advantage. I always remember before they put the leaders to go out last, and it was all drawn for. The old professional always say it was a great advantage to get your blow in first and let the others see what they can do about it. And there are seven couples behind Nicholas, including all, of course, his challengers. So, uh, what about two here. One behind the three leaders, Beard, Crenshaw, and Graham. Nicholas on the short 14th. And uh, very much the same as Palmer's, only rather better. And we'll give that uh, about seven paces for a birdie to for Nicholas. Uh, this is a, a striking moment. It might be the turning point. You're looking at Peter Oosterhaus, second shot, par four, 11th hole. And he's looking at the better part of 160 yards. And you can see with our roving camera, he does not have much of a shot. Got to get it up quick. Bring it over the tree and hope it hooks a little bit for you. He left it in the rough, short of the green, but over the bunker. So the ball is sitting up. I can see it from where I'm sitting, so the ball is in not that bad a lie. For his third shot to the pen, now we'll consider Ben Crenshaw, who hit his ball just a little longer, but in the same general area. Oosterhaus was able to carry up over the tree, Byron, but it appears that Ben will not be able to. I don't think he will. Ben's close enough to the tree that he's... Ben has the big problem to keep the ball low under the tree and yet skip across the rough. And he has an opening, though, I think, in front of the green that he can skirt between the two bunkers. But his problem is keeping the ball, playing the shot out of the rough, it's hard to hit it low because the grass will catch it so often and you'll let the ball pop right up into the tree or into the rough. So he, 
He has been negotiating a great all week, though. So you see the three overhanging. Here he is in the rough. Now, he's got to keep the ball out of the rough, but underneath, and that's what he did, and he played it very, very well. Just Thanks. off the edge of the green to the left in the sharp rub. Just off the edge of the left green. Gentlemen, we now have nine men within two shots of each other. Nine men. Well, you'd pick the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Their names are Beard, Crenshaw, Graham, Nicholas, Fitzsimons, Oosterhaus, Mahaffey, Murphy, and the defending champion, Hale Irwin. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The U.S. have really been surprising. They've really come together, haven't they? We might be here for a week. U.S. Open Lottery. Has there ever been a nine-way playoff for anything? Lou Graham. the aircraft is drowning out anything in your living room uh, that is totally unavoidable we're right in the landing pattern for pattern for a hair international airport which i believe has an average of something like a takeoff and landing every 45 seconds and every one of them is going about a couple of thousand feet over our heads it seems like and then we have the traffic outside the golf course also as you saw yeah but if you're thinking about uh, your game you're not worried about the traffic or those planes you're probably not even hearing them really certainly not this man right henry no Here's the moment we may have been waiting for so long. If this goes in for a birdie two on the 14th for Nicholas, a huge shout will go up and strike fear into the hearts of the whole of the rest of them following on behind. It's about 13 feet. Ben Crenshaw here at the 11th, contemplating his short pitch out of the rough. The ball sitting up quite well, but the rough grass there is kind of bunchy. Got to be delicate with it. He has a fair amount of green to work with. Yes, Chrissy, I mean, uh, excuse me, Keith, he's got to drop the ball very softly, which he did. He is played that shot all week. I've watched him play so many holes. He just had the touch around the green of a fine jeweler. Jack Nicholas for par. So Jack remains at plus two for the tournament. Leaderboard showing Frank Beard, Ben Crenshaw, sitting alone at plus one, but the group remains heavy in contention. You're looking at the 15th green, you see the leaderboard. Jack Nicklaus is on the tee here at 15. It's a 318-yard hole. It is not a difficult hole at all if you keep your first shot, your tee shot, on the short grass. Jack Nicklaus is on the tee. I'm sure there must be a temptation for a fellow like Jack to take out the rifle and just rip it because he could knock it right down in front of the green. But no, he goes with an iron for control, probably a one iron. In his case, perhaps even less because he wants only to get it to the top of the hill. From that swing, the way he did, I, I believe he used only about four. Very well. He's carried the top of the hill. He takes it down into almost perfect position, and the pen placement today is not terribly difficult. So Jack Nicholas will have maybe less than 100 yards, not much more than that, to the pen. All he's got to do is just carry across those bunkers and clear those bunkers, then he can have the ball within the 15 feet of the hole. 
Frank Beard on the 10th hole now. Let's get back to this man who's had his troubles today. He made the turn in 40. That's four over par. But this is for a birdie on the par 5 10th hole. This putt should break a little from left to right. This one he does. He can play outside the hole because there's a pretty big break there. Despite his tribulations, remember, he's still tied for the lead. Ben Crenshaw left it to the right. Mm -hmm. Anticipating the possibility of a playoff, there's never been a four-man playoff for the U.S. Open, but there have been a lot of three-man playoffs, set seven of them altogether, in two of which a man named Nelson participated, winning one and losing one. For the par now, for Frank Beard, to keep him at one over par for the tournament. He's four over on today's round. He's sure making sure those short ones now. At the well, that's a little shorter than the ones that he missed. Yeah. And it just, he, he left himself a couple of those little mean kind, about four feet long. Lou Graham's second shot on 11. Is it long enough? No, just short of the green. Skipped out of the long rough. He's right up in front with an easy chip and a lot of green to work with. All right, here's Pat Fitzsimons playing with Frank Beard. Fitz Simons at plus two is only one shot out of the lead, a birdie here. And that's what he's putting for. Could tie him for the lead again. There you see it. Beard and Crenshaw tie for the lead. One back, Nicholas, Graham, and Fitz Simons, the man you're watching at the moment. Hale Irwin at plus three, remember, the defending champion, not quite out of it. This is almost on the same land that Oosterhaus was a moment ago, Jim. His ball, if he gets it to the left of the hole, it will not come back in. True enough. He's left himself a little knee knocker there. Okay, Fitzsimons, the 24-year-old from Oregon, trying to stamp his name in the record books with the greatest names in golf. He would not be a long shot, anything like the dimensions of uh, a Sam Parks or Jack Fleck, but a big surprise just the same. And we would certainly hope that whoever wins this tournament will move on to Carnoustie in the month of July for the British Open Championship. Should it be Jack Nicklaus, of course, he would be trying for the third leg of that grand slam that's never been achieved. We will be there, ABC Sports. We'll also be at the PGA Championship later in Akron, Ohio, at the great Firestone Country Club to see what transpires. All right, got his par. He remains a shot off the lead. Back to 15, second shot of Jack Nicklaus. You see the pin, you see the huge bunkers that sit between him and where he wants to put the scalp ball. Keith, this is a lob high pitch shot just to let the ball drop. And this shot Jack is quite good at. He can pitch the ball high, let the ball land rather soft. He has a long, full, kind of a soft uh, action on this. A lot of arms and knee action here. He does not have a birdie putt at 15. He is over the back of the green. And he'll have the better part of 65 feet to the pin downhill. So Jack Nicholas, with an opportunity, did not exercise it on 15. As we talk about Jack Nicklaus, it is worth reminding you that his playing partner, the great Arnold Palmer, has now slipped to six over par. Jack remains at plus two for the tournament. As you look at the leaderboard, you see two men at the top, Beard and Crenshaw, at plus one. Ben Crenshaw. Interesting young man. Earlier, Jim McKay talked with him. Ben, you came out on the golf tour as a golden boy out of Texas. You won your first tournament. There were a lot of well-wishers gathered around you, and possibly even a few who just wanted to hang on to a shooting star, and things got tough. Suddenly, you're playing extremely well in this championship. Is there a specific reason? I think that uh, this week, I, I haven't uh, gotten nervous one time. I uh, somehow feel like uh, I'm taking the, this as another tournament, and. Uh, I know that people are going to make bogeys, and I'm going to make bogeys too. And uh, I've relied very heavily on my short game this week, which is going very well. I haven't met, remember uh, hitting a bad putt over 36 holes. It's, I love U.S. Open greens. They're fast, and uh, they're very, very true. And uh, it gives me an added confidence when I know 
where I can hit the putt and I know where it's going. Does the fact that uh, there will be a Mrs. Crenshaw a week from tomorrow in Holmesford, New York, I believe the wedding is going to take place. Right. Uh, figure in this anywhere? You think that's, that's well, I mean, got you not nervous, as you said? It'd be a very nice wedding present <laughs> Yeah. to win the Open. But, uh, yes, I'm, I'm thinking a good deal about that, and uh, I'm kind of anxious to get that uh, over with. And uh, I just wish she was here. And so says young Mr. Crenshaw. Jack Nicklaus is on the 15th green for the very long putt. And again, we keep reminding you that he steadied his game. He has just been as steady as he could be working his way toward the clubhouse. And once he goes in the clubhouse, if he does make it that far at two over, there it is, fellas, take your best shot. Keith, I'm sure that Jack was very unhappy with himself for such a poor shot because really, uh, from the shortest shots he had to leave the ball this far away from the hole on a hole that is the possible good birdie hole. Well, I'm sure he was very unhappy with it. Now then, he's going to have to work just to make four. I would trim the size of the putt down a tad. I'd drop it down in the neighborhood of 52 feet. I thought it had run all the way to the back, but it had not. But you better not get too firm with it. Normal tendency for many of the players who have come from this locale have been to leave it a little short. But it's a good roll by Jack. Oh, that sensational putt from that far away. <laughs> Jack only plays well under pressure. <laughs> That's just about the truth of it. He's just been kind of so-called steady and kind of just almost sneaking around all week. That just tap for the par. That man can't sneak anywhere anymore, Byron. <laughs> no, not very well. <laughs> Gentlemen, to keep up to date on documenting things, the leader in the clubhouse now is Bob Murphy at 69. He finishes at plus four. Then there's a three-stroke gap back to Ray Floyd and Andy North, who finished at plus seven. Tommy Aaron is 69 today, but he finished at plus 11. Uh, Jerry Page is the amateur leader in the clubhouse at plus nine. These are the scores of men who have finished their rounds today. On the golf course, that's the situation. Beard and Crenshaw tie for the lead. One stroke behind, Nicholas, Lou Graham, and Pat Fitzsimons. Oh, boy. Okay, Keith. Frank Beard, off the tee, four wood. Absolutely dead perfect in the center of the fairway. Could not drop it in a more ideal position. His playing partner, Pat Fitzsimons, in some trouble. Bob Rossberg, are you with them? Keith, uh, Beard hit a perfect four wood off the tee. He's about 120 yards, playing a pitching wedge. Try and loft it up in the air, land it about 20 feet short, and let it run on. Wind at his back. A lot of green to work with, though, Keith. As Bob said, he's got plenty of green to work with. He can let the ball land. Tom Watson birdied 11 a moment ago to go to four over. As Beard's shot is on its way, and it's a fine golf shot. Definite birdie putt coming for Frank Beard at 11. He left the ball 12 feet from the hole. Now in the shrubs, as they say in your home country, Byron. Pat Fitzsimons, as we look from behind him to show you the kind of position, he's going to have to just chuck it out of there. Yes, he's got a tree ball in his backswing. He's got a tree a number of trees, I should say, between to uh, get the ball out. Right here, he's just trying to get the club not, so he does not hit the tree on his backswing and just play this ball out into the fairway. Well, possibly lifts a little bit, but he can't hook it from here. If that tree was not in his way on his backswing, he might hook it around and put it by the edge of the green. But this, all he can do is just play it out, which he has done. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Tell me about a golf shot. He brought that ball right down past the front of the green. It's stuck in the short rough. He has a great live and a lot of green to work with on a chip. Now, that was a spectacular golf shot from a most confining position. Meantime, let's have a watch at Ben Crenshaw. This is Crenshaw's. Yeah, playing very coolly. Middle. He's got a rather strange, almost unprofessional-like swing, and that's perhaps a rather unprofessional-like shot. It wasn't from very far away, and you can see how far he is away from the flag, making hard work of the easy holes. 
Peter, we can scratch the name Trevino from our list. Lee took a triple bogey seven at the 13th. He's at plus eight. It's wait till next year. Yeah. Wonderful galleries here today. They get a fine view of them. Very colorfully dressed. Overcast. Breeze is blowing quite stiffly. It's been south and quartering southeast, southwest nearly all day today. Great day's entertainment. That's the position at the moment. Beard and Crenshaw still together. Nicholas Graham, Fitzsimons and Mahaffey all very close behind. Of this group, Peter, does any of these men's game fit Carnoustie coming up for the British Open better than any other? Perhaps right here, huh? Oh, I think this man is um, quite remarkable, isn't he? This is the 16th. This 452 yard downwind par four. He can get a big drive down the left side, sliding a bit to the right. He'll leave himself only a... Ooh, is a real... Looks as if he collapsed a bit on that, and that's gone left. A hundred yards left in the trees. We get near the end here. Has won only two tournaments in an 11-year career on the tour of it. There he is. Now, again, he has to wait. That's right. That's exactly what I was going to point out to you. He's back there again. I, I think uh, Lou is a very calm person. He, he doesn't get excited even when things go bad, and certainly they couldn't be going any better than they are right now for him. But uh, it's still got to work on you a little bit. You'd much rather, I think, walk up and play the shot in your own time rather than to have to wait might throw in here all of our most sincere thanks to everybody at Medina and at the USGA for the tremendous cooperation we've gotten. John Jakeman, the green superintendent here, everybody else. Well, he's done a remarkable job. You, I was here about two weeks before the tournament, and the course was in absolutely magnificent shape. And then they had those thunderstorms last weekend, the first part of the week, <coughs> as Frank Beard gets ready to make his uh, attempt at 17. And all right. this young man needs this putt, James. We return to the drama. We've had all these weights in between, and then suddenly <laughs> things tighten up again, and you realize that this is the most putt for Frank Beard. He's got a have... pretty big break here, Jim, left to right, or right to left as you look at it on your screen. The green marked quite a bit by spikes, of course, after a long day of play. Concentrate on hitting a solid putt. Oh, so very close. Uh, It'll be a bogey four for Beard, and that says it. As far as he's concerned, Frank Beard will go to plus four in a tie with Ben Crenshaw, Hale Irwin, and Bob Murphy. <laughs> he must hope for the bogey on the part of Graham and then a birdie by himself. Again, that moves Mahaffey up. Now, John has moved into second all by himself. Lou Graham, by the way, was a member of the 1973 Ryder Cup team, and those Ryder Cup matches will be coming up this fall. Laurel Valley. We're talking about Lou a little earlier, as you look at Crenshaw, he did get the drop, and uh, has played his third shot there as Lou sort of stalks around his ball back in the fairway. But this, uh, and I feel for that man there, you lead the open, you try your heart out, and uh, just see it slip away from you. I know you go home. You'll go home tonight thinking about all the things, as Peter Allen said, that you gave away or you felt like you gave away, even though you tried your heart out all day. But Lou Graham uh, has only won two tournaments, but he has finished second and third a number of times. He's really been unlucky, Jim, in his career, I think, not to have won a few more tournaments than he has. And third tied in the U.S. Open just last year at Wingfoot in that very difficult golf course. Just to finish at Wingfoot, you should have gotten a medal, I believe. <laughs> Peter Oosterhouse now on the 18th. Still coming in ABC's coverage of golf this summer, the British Open Championship from Carnoustie, and you can be sure that Peter Oosterhouse will be there. And uh, then we have the PGA Championship in Akron. Both on ABC. Not That's a very short. good putt by Peter at the last hole, but it's been that kind of day, I think, for a lot of the guys. You just... Now, little Ben is getting prepared for the drop of his life. <laughs> <laughs> Let's drop this one very well. That's right. Lou Graham waiting out on the fairway. Lou Graham earned a uh, golf scholarship to Memphis State. He didn't finish down there, and 
be honest about it, he said a number of times he didn't like school from the day he went into the first grade. So he went out and played himself fine golf. Well, there are a number of us that didn't like school from the first day, <laughs> and then there are those like you that like school. Now tell me, who did like school from the first grade? <laughs> All right. This is for a par four. Yeah. After the drop and the hit up. Again, it's the last few holes. You've seen double bogey at 17 cost him what chance he had to win. Look at that. Edmund <laughs> uh, Rascal has done that all week long. Uh, four to bring Ken Crenshaw in at plus four for the championship. Plus three on today's round, round 74. Oh, what he would have done to also make that bogey putt on 17. Yeah. Or not to have gone in the water. Now, Lou Graham, here is the final moment, it seems, of uncertainty in this golf championship. If Lou Graham can put this safely on the green, he should be able to get down in two putts. I think he got his club out in a little hurry. I thought there he, uh, he thought the green was going to be clear, but Peter has his putt for his par four. Yep. And a good finish in the tournament, Jim. Five Kitchen. over. Gives you an idea of the anxiety of Lou Graham when he didn't notice the man there on the green. Well, I'm sure he feels like he's been out there a lifetime waiting and a good, good 289 finish by Peter Ruth Graham. Congratulations from Ken Gordon to Ben Crenshaw for a fine U.S. Open. So close, but yet so far. All right, Lou. Sweet Lou. Put a good swing on this, Jim. What do you think he has there? He's probably got a four or it's a four or five iron. We Bill just Cummings got a report says five. Oh my goodness, he's gone in the bunker. Well, he has gone in the bunker. Stand by, it is not over. As happened so many times in the United States Open, the simple pressure of the final hole has taken it. Could there have been anything difficult about that shot aside from the pressure? <laughs> you know. Well, the difficult thing, I think, was the pressure, Jim. Of course. Lou is a right to left player, and he started the ball out to the right there then, and it just didn't take his natural hook into the hole. I'm sure he looked like he made a good swing to me, and as Tom Watson gets ready to play his shot into the flag, uh, it just didn't hook like he was playing for him. Should there be a playoff, we now have to start saying that again. We will be back here. It'll be tomorrow. And we will be showing it, James. Yeah, we'll be here. There's another look at that. We'll take a look at this slow motion of Lou's swing. He takes the club back. Looks like a good swing. Nice shoulder turn. Maybe a little shorter back swing than Lou normally takes. He goes through the ball. He just starts it a little bit more to the right than he meant to. But as I said, Lou is generally a right to left player. It's another good swing he made. On balance. Now, tell me this, Dave. How good a bunker player is Lou Graham? Uh, Lou Graham is... Like most of the guys, he's a good bunker player. I think that Luke plays the bunker shot a little bit lower than uh, he's going to need for this particular shot he has. He does not have a lot of green to work with, Jim, and it's not a very long shot. If there is a playoff, as we said, we will be here, and it will start at 4.30 Eastern time. That is our telecast. We'll start at 4.30 Eastern time. Frank Beard now on the 18th tee, a man who suddenly may still have a chance. That's right. He needs a birdie, though. He must have a birdie to even time a happy, remember, who's in the clubhouse at plus three. Beard is plus four. Okay, he's got a good shot. Frank has hit it in the number one position for him in the left side of the fairway, so he, too, can start his hook out there with plenty of room. And when he walks out there and gets to the turn of this fairway, he will probably see Lou Graham standing in the bunker, and the adrenaline, the adrenaline may start flowing again. I'm sure there are a number of his friends already down there in the driving area who will alert him to that fact. But this uh, certainly is the most important trap shot of this young man's career up to now, Jim. Just put it up on the green. Don't do anything funny. He's no time, and he's left it way short. Oh, well, you know, he hit this only soft spot there. There's a real, the green, the first two cuts there, no one's hardly walked on today, and that's very soft. If he'd have carried that another foot, I think, I know that the ball would have run down that hill. Now he's left himself a putt to, to and win. It's, uh, <laughs> Unless he makes this putt, we almost certainly will have a playoff tomorrow. There is John Mahaffey, who would be one of the participants at age 27. Ooh. You notice he didn't go anyplace. No, I <laughs> He don't. likes to watch golf at this I point. I don't blame John. If 
uh, I'd ever been in that position. I <laughs> dogged everybody. Uh, Keith Jackson's down there. Could you get John for a quick word, do you think? Okay, he's probably trying to set that up. That's Fitzsimons. Well, that's uh, Tom Watson's third shot here at 18. That's uh, Keith, are you there? Yes, Jim, I'm here with John. Oh, Your good. feelings right now. Well, Keith, I don't want to wish anybody any bad uh, right now, really, but I'd, I would like to win this golf tournament probably more than anything else in the world. And uh, I'm just a little nervous right now. I know Lou's such a great putter. He's allowed to just put this right in the middle of the hole. You sort of came striding out of the shadows of the earlier day and played a very steady round. Well, I was very lucky today in the fact that I didn't make that many mistakes and I made a lot of pars when I needed to and a few birdies crucial times today and uh, felt pretty good about my round. What a glorious moment it has to be, though, if you realize that he winds up with a two-putt. Let's follow it with Jim and David. Okay. Interestingly, we have discussed this yesterday. I noticed on his scorecard that John Mahaffey took bogey twice and immediately took birdie on the next hole today. That's what does it. That's... Now, Lou Graham must make this to win the U.S. Open Championship today. Now, this putt, <clears throat> if he gets it too far outside the right, by too far, I mean, if he plays it outside of the right edge of the hole, will not break in enough. He's got to keep the ball just inside the right edge of the hole, Jim. And it's going to break to his left. Oh, yes, oh, 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 oh. From the start, it was, it was too slow. Well, you can't imagine how nervous you are. I mean, if it were me, I know how nervous I would be. And you don't want to let the thing just explode when you, when you hit it. You're trying to hit a good putt. You want to make it. You don't want to knock it two feet by the hole and really have one of those coming back. Of course, the look, you can see, I play a lot of golf with these guys, and you never see such strain as you, as you do when it's the U.S. Open or the PGA or the British no. Open. Their faces, they look so drained. and. Look at that. Do you think you could hit a green with a five iron? You know, he's got to go home tonight thinking, golly, if I could just put the ball on the green. And Beard's still out on the fairway. That's right. Uh, there's Watson. I feel sorry for him. He's had uh, two bad last rounds in, in this tournament and just a bad round last year at Wingfoot. That brings him in at a 77 today after a 78 yesterday. The first two days were 67 and, 70 and 68. The top finish for him. He ends at plus six for the tournament. I'll just tap in. Now, there will be a playoff unless Frank Beard does a Lou Warshaw yeah. many years ago and the slides the second shot in the hole. And the same town, but you should mention that. Huh? It was right. in Chicago. The so-called World Championship of Golf many years ago at the Tamashanter Club here, it was a wedge shot, however, that Lou Warsham uh, put in the hole. And Chandler right. Harper fainted, if Chandler I remember. Chandler Harper, he's right. the man to finish second. Virginia. Yep. But uh, all of a sudden, here's Frank back in the game. He's had just uh, one of those days that you didn't want to have, out 40 and three over on the back nine. He's seven over for today's round, and, and but still with a chance. If he could make a birdie here at the last hole, we would have a triple playoff tomorrow. There will be at least a double playoff. He's that, unless it goes in the hole. We'll see what he's done. He started it out in the right-hand trap. Now he's been playing that big hook all day. Let's see if it gets back. Nope. Oh, uh, even with a little assist from that tree, he put it in almost the exact place that Lou Graham was a moment ago. That's right. Almost exactly the same shot. And now he would have to hold out from the bunker, and his hopes are in the realm of miracle at this point. Well, you can see. I think that tells it right there, Jim. Yep. Just, uh... Of course, he wanted to get very close to the flagstick. It is on the right-hand side of the green. And after this pause for station identification, we'll be back with more exclusive color coverage of the 75th U.S. Open Golf Championship. this might have been for Frank Beard. He had a three-shot lead when the day began. It has all dwindled. It has disappeared. And now he must put the ball in the hole from out of a sand bunker, or else it's all over for the U.S. Open for him in 1975. There will be a playoff tomorrow. Two participants will be Lou Graham and John Mahaffey. He said to join them, he must hold out from where you see the ball sitting now. 
Should he do that, it would be the first triple playoff since 1963 when Julius Boros beat Jackie Cuban and Arnold Palmer. Tim, you look back over the day, and earlier in the day when we were up here and Bob Murphy finished, he had an unplayable lie, or at least a penalty stroke here at the last hole, and he finished his four over par. Now, you know, Bob could look back at that and say, you know, if he'd hit the ball just a little better, because he went ahead and made uh, the hole in four strokes without the penalty after that. But uh, so many things have happened. Balls in the water at 17, and right here, now, here, here it, it comes. Is. Has to go in the hole. Good shot. He sure was trying for the hole. Well, but too far. Too far. At this point, it doesn't make any difference whether he makes a par or not. He had to get the ball at least by the hole to have any kind of chance. And now he'll have to make a longish putt for a par four to remain in the tie for third place with Ben Crenshaw, Hale Irwin, Bob Murphy. The playoff then will be two men. Lou Graham of Nashville, Tennessee against John Mahaffey of Houston, Texas. A 10-year difference in their ages, Graham at 37, Mahaffey at 27. Graham finally getting the opportunity to win the U.S. Open after a long professional career and endless miles walked on the professional tour. John Mahaffey, who has been promising from the moment he came out here a couple of years ago, having an early opportunity to be a champion. Pat Fitzsimons here has had a terrible day. He started out at even par. He is now six over. And a couple of double bogeys on the back nine. Until then, he was still in contention. Again, a reminder, we will be back at 4.30 Eastern time tomorrow for our coverage of the playoff for most of these ABC stations. And he's gone by. We'll have that one for a par four. The thunderstorms have disappeared. The drama begins to dissipate now. It'll start all over again tomorrow. We'll all be here tonight. And uh, there's the look at the final green. Documenting our coverage of the 75th United States Open, we've shown you coverage of 13 holes yesterday and today. We had our highlight show on Friday night. We'll be bringing you the British Open from Carnoustie and the PGA from Akron later this summer. And now we have the two men who will play off tomorrow for the championship, John Mahaffey and Lou Graham with Keith Jackson. Phew. The, the tedium, the weight, was that a bothersome thing for you, Lou? No, I hit the best shot of the day after the weight. Uh, it's a tough shot to stand there and look at, but uh, you're talking about back on 17, aren't you? No, I said over and got a good rest, and then I hit as good a shot as I could hit. The ball landed about three feet from the flag and went about 15, 18 feet by. Anytime I put it in there like that with a two iron, I'm happy. Both of you played steady, smooth game of golf today, and suddenly, out of the shadows, there you were with a chance to win it all, the greatest prize in golf. Well, I was a little bit surprised at the overall scoring, to tell you the truth. Uh, I didn't think the course played that hard today myself. I just played, I felt like, fair. I putted well on the front side. Uh, overall, uh, just played kind of so-so today, I feel like. How does the Tennessean and the Texan feel about going into the playoff tomorrow? Well, I don't know about Lou, but I feel great about it. I started out today and didn't really think I had a very good chance unless I shot 67 or something like that. And to have an opportunity to get in the playoff is uh, really a great feeling for me. Well, I'm very surprised to be here, too, shooting a 73. Uh, of course, everybody else had their troubles, uh, but uh, I'm uh, certainly anxious to get out there and play, and I can't think of a better thing to be playing for. What about the night before? How in the world will the two of you spend tonight? Well, I don't know exactly what I'm... I've never been in this position, Keith, so I don't know uh -huh. what's going to go on. I'm probably going to go out and have an early dinner and uh, probably go to bed early and try to sleep as much as I can. Well, that'll be about the same thing I'll do. I've never been in this position either, so I won't know how I'll react until tonight. Good luck to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. You're against okay. Jim. Thank you, Keith. So that's it. We're back tomorrow. Lou Gray against John Mahaffey at 18 holes for the U.S. Open Championship. Our coverage beginning at 4.30 Eastern time over most of these ABC stations. It's been a long day, humid and hot, lightning and thunder. But what an exciting afternoon. Ground transportation provided by the Chevrolet Motor Division. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. Come catch the spirit with United and Arnie Palmer with great golf vacation throughout your land. Once again, tomorrow, 4.30 Eastern, the playoff between these two. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.
Regularly scheduled programs will not be seen today so that we may bring you the playoff round of the U.S. Open Golf Championship. The game of golf, like so many things in America, was an import brought here in the late 19th century by emigrating Scots. The spectacle was a strange one in a frontier society, but it took root in the East, spread to Chicago. A U.S. Golf Association was formed and an open championship started. The American golfing explosion had begun. And now they have gathered near Chicago for the diamond anniversary, the 75th U.S. Open. What began with a handful at Newport, Rhode Island in 1895 is now the world's greatest tournament. The Scots dominated first. Willie Anderson won it four times. Gene Sarazen made Knickers famous with two victories. Bobby Jones, an amateur, emphasized the word open in the tournament's title. Time moved on, and the classic swing of Byron Nelson took the crown. Ben Hogan equaled the four wins of Willie Anderson and Bob Jones. A man named Palmer made the game an obsession for Americans in the 60s. And Jack Nicklaus stamped his name in the book as perhaps the greatest of all. And now we're here at Medina for the diamond anniversary, the 75th United States Open. And the question occurs, to what golfer will this diamond be a guy's best friend? Well, the jewel still hangs in the balance a day after the tournament should have ended. In a two-man playoff, 37-year-old Lou Graham of Tennessee is the leader at this moment, seeking his first major victory in 11 years on the Pro Tour. But still fighting for the crown is John Mahaffey of Texas, 10 years younger than Graham, and also after his first major title. It's head-to-head, -head, man to man golf for the U.S. Open Championship. Illinois, it's the playoff for the 75th United States Open Golf Championship. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Texaco. On behalf of the independent Texaco retailers in all 50 states, who are working to keep your trust with state trooper-tested Haveline Super Premium All-Temperature Motor Oil. And by Firestone, the radial tire people, makers of the Steel Radial 500. For well, the leader... down at Kerrville, Texas, a river hill where Joe Finger and I built a nice golf course. He's a great young man. Lou Graham is playing very, very steady. Hitting a pitching wedge for his second shot. Short, gets a good kick, comes just to the edge of the green. The ball is still resting on the collar, but it certainly will be a putt for Lou Graham. So they are both in birdie range and actually, though Mahaffey hit the better shot of the two, Graham is closer to the hole. This 7,032 yard golf course at Medina plays to a par 71 and so far Lou Graham has handled it well. Jim? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay with our resident golf pro and expert of ABC Sports, Dave Marr, the former PGA champion, at our anchor position behind the 18th green. And what a tournament it has been. 72 holes showed many potential winners from Frank Beard to Tom Watson to Jack Nicklaus to, well, we had nine men within a two-stroke radius there uh, for a couple of holes yesterday. But when it was all over, these two fellows were tied for the lead. We have quite a team here. For the first time in history, I think we have four times as many commentators as we have players. That's, there's no question about it. I was surprised at the play yesterday jim uh if i could talk a little bit about that uh really uh in in sports when you say choke i think people take that the wrong way but there was a lot of choking going on out there yesterday because it is the u.s open 
and the golf course being a great golf course, that's, I drove the scores up also. I was really disappointed in, in some of the shots that were hit out there, but that's just the pressure of winning a major championship, and of course, this may be the biggest one to win of all. And of course, the U.S. Open, as you say, always brings out this sort of thing, even in the best golfers in the world, but yesterday, I think there were more just bad shots hit by these great golfers than I've ever seen in my life. In other words, it wasn't so much the golf course of Medina or the way the USGA had toughened it up that was getting to them. Like Jack Nicholas's tee shot at 16 was something I almost could have hit. <laughs> well, you, you just couldn't hit it as far, That's I don't think. Uh, it just seemed like when he, when he knew he had a chance for the lead, he got up and when he hit, made that uh, swing, it looked like he went into a full faint at impact. I mean, I was just surprised, but it just shows you that it can happen to anyone and uh, when it happens to Jack, then all of us are subject to it. That's right. Well, of course, we'll be with this playoff until it finishes and should they be tied at the end of 18 holes, it's sudden death. It will not go over tomorrow unless the thunderstorms come, and I just heard a bit of thunder. Keith? You're encouraging, aren't you? <laughs> John Mahaffey sizing up this 20-footer. He'll putt first. Lou Graham's ball is just off the putting surface. Of these two men in their four previous rounds, Mahaffey is the only one to have had a birdie on this hole. He birded it in the first round of play. Lou Graham played it par all four rounds. Keith? In head-to-head -head competition over a period of years, we've always wondered and thought how much of influence on the match it had, where the pin placements are. Today, the pin placements are generally put on the front left. Of course, this one is not, which we, I would feel would give Lou a little bit of advantage because Tom is, uh, John's a fader. We've got that rolling beautiful. It looked in, but curled away just at the cup. If he'd hit it just a fraction firmer, he would have had himself a birdie. So he will tap in for par and remain one over on today's playoff round. And three shots back of Lou Graham, who's looking at a birdie opportunity himself from 16 feet. Lou Graham at two under for today's playoff round. A Texan and a Tennessean squared off here. You know, there have been 24 playoffs now in 75 years of the United States Open Golf Championship. That's a lot. That certainly is one of every three years. Lou's putt it might, might break slightly to his left and is a little downhill, a little faster than what John's was. It's breaking. He well, caught edge of it. He burned the edge, too, but it wouldn't go. He's got a couple of inches to tap in. So both men make par here at 11 and proceed on their way with Lou Graham holding a three-shot edge over John Mahaffey. Peter Ellis from Britain will describe the 12th for you. Well, the 12th here at Medina, 384 yards. It looks a comparatively simple par four, but the pin position today is very difficult indeed. This is a, an aerial shot of the hole. Up the fairway, big trap on the left-hand side. About 30 paces across the fairway there in the landing area. But the big feature today are the trees up at the top of the picture there, about 11 o'clock. We're going into them now because the flag today is positioned back left at this 12th in a very challenging position indeed. These two playing very steadily. There was a lot of talk around the campfires last night about what had happened to American golf because perhaps two of the most famous people were not in contention. But uh, the plain facts are the examination paper was set here and uh, the two people who made the fewest mistakes are here today and one of them is going to win this great championship and whatever happens to him after that nothing in the world is going to take that away from him and they're playing very much like champions so far this is the way they played uh, the whole in the previous uh, four rounds Graham has the edge there. Very good crowds again here today. The official attendance was just under 100,000 for the four days. Peter? Peter? Hello, yes. Well, this Byron. You know, I was out here. I'm out here at the 12th hole, and uh, the pin is cut way back left, and there's big trees guarding that on the left, and if you must be in the right third of the fairway if you have a clear shot to the green today. Yes, it's very challenging indeed. But really, for these mighty hitters, I suppose it's a, a long iron and a seven iron. That's all it is, really. But that looks rather like a three wood. So 
He may well be just uh, trying to ease it up right of the trap, right and short of that first trap as you look at the little diagram on the right-hand side. It's very surprising when you watch this man swing with his fine rhythm and uh, easy sort of disposition that he hasn't been uh, far more successful. He's been out here for a long time. Of course, he's won a lot of money, but he hasn't won uh, many tournaments and certainly no major championship. Just watch this nice, easy swing, and perhaps you, like I, will wonder why. Well, they don't come much better than that in swing. Watching it slightly anxiously may have let it go a little bit to the right. Just gone off the fairway on the right side, and that's a uh, little encouraging applause. He's certainly in the best position to come into the green, which is very sloping. This is Mahaffey. Not a big man, but you saw how he cracked into that with his hands, pushed it away into the crowd on the right. And it all depends on the line. But they have certainly, they both of them certainly try to place their tee shots on the right side of the fairway. So we'll be back to watch their second shots after this short message. We're back at the U.S. Open Golf Championship at Diana Country Club outside Chicago. 18-hole playoff on Monday here for the title. Lou Graham leading John Mahaffey by three strokes. Let's go out on the golf course now to the 12th hole to former British Ryder Cup player Peter Ellis. There's Lou, Peter. Inside the fairway, this is Lou Graham. Ahead at this moment and looking very cool, calm and collected. This 12th hole... Not a long one in yardage, 384 yards, but a very demanding hole. Cost a lot of people a lot of strokes this week. The shorter of the two drives, and he might be in the lighter rough. The trees on the left of the green are no real trouble to him from this angle coming into the green. He seemed to get that a little bit grassy, a little heavy. But it got it up onto the green safely. It's quite a long way from the flag. Let's go out to Bob Rosberg. John Mahaffey caught a fairly decent lie for being in the thick rough. He's got a straight shot at the hole, but he's hit it a little heavy. It's going to come up about where Lou's ball is. Well short of the hole. He probably has a 90-foot putt left. Yes, he certainly does. He's just on the front of the green. Just the sort of thing that he didn't want at this time. He's three strokes behind and uh, certainly not challenging here at the 12th. Okay, so there they are. Lou Graham. It's Sweet Lou and Little John walking at home. We talked to them both earlier and asked them, what was last night like for you? What kind of evening have you had since yesterday? I'm sure you've heard from a few people that you didn't expect to hear from and some that uh, must have been talking to you all the time. Yes, uh, I, I'm amazed at how many people have contacted me and called. And uh, uh, we did have to tell them to take the phone off the hook uh, at about quarter to 11 last night. And uh, uh, it's been uh, very enjoyable. I've enjoyed it very much. I slept very good last night. Uh, better than I thought it did, I guess. Everybody told me they had lightning and thunder at the hotel last night, and I didn't hear any of it, so apparently I slept better than I thought. Well, Saturday night, uh, the tough night, night is all the guys did who were contenders, but was last night a little bit different still? Last night, uh, I thought it would be, but I didn't have that bad a night. I, I went to bed at about 11 o'clock and got up a little after 9 o'clock this morning, so, and I slept pretty well all through the night. I wasn't quite as restless as I thought I, I was going to be, so I've got a good night's sleep, and uh, I hit a few balls yesterday afternoon trying to straighten out some things that I'd done wrong yesterday, and I felt like I have, and it's just a matter of going out there and going through my fundamentals and trying to play a good solid round of golf. So that's the way they felt about last evening. John Mahaffey. 27 years old from Houston, 
out of the University of Houston, the product of Coach Dave Williams down there. But Peter, it's yours out on 12. Well, you could uh, see how far Mahaffey's walked up from where he placed his second shot. And this is very, very crucial for him here because he's already three shots behind. He's miles away from the flag. He's almost got what we in Britain would call a St. Andrews putt. You know, we've got greens at St. Andrews. That There's one, in fact, that's just over one acre in size, and you can have a putt there that really, if you take a taxi, costs about three pounds to go the whole journey. And look, this is, this is a real St. Andrews putt. He's walking and walking and walking and walking. And it will be a great feat for him to get down in two strokes from here. Now, uh, Graham is at least a third nearer the hole than Mahaffey. So, uh, great strain on the young man here. That's the length of it, look. Well, he's given it a good hit. Will it be enough? Will it be too much? Look at that. Now, that is perfection. That is judgment to perfection, and... Uh, that's why they're professionals, but that really was a professional shot. Beautifully, beautifully judged. Almost hold it, and he will be absolutely delighted. Got it up to within, what, nine inches. Tremendous effort. Now pressure right back on Graham. Graham, three strokes ahead here at the 12th. Now it's up to him to get down in two. As long as he can keep matching Mahaffey's score, he will win the event. And also, a good speed, but there's still a little... A little work left. Holes are running out for Mahaffey, but there are still plenty of dangerous ones left. And two or three strokes can disappear in a flash. As when Jack Nicholas, Peter, bogeyed 16, 17, and 18 yesterday. Yes, indeed, Jim. Among uh, other people. It was interesting to see that the last three holes yesterday played 77 over par by the entire <laughs> field, which is rather frightening. It certainly is. This is Lou Graham for a par of the 12th. Very confidently into the middle. No trembling of the knees. So he marches on to the 12th, to the 13th, rather, after 12 holes, three strokes ahead. This 13th hole here at Medina Country Club has been described by both Kerry Middlecoff and Jack Nicklaus as the most difficult hole on the golf course. At the Dog Lake, which you're seeing now, we are about 200 yards from the teeing area. A very severe Dog Lake, a sharp left-hand turn into the green. The second shot can be anything from a four iron to a four wood, depending upon the wind. There's a deep gully in front of the green, and many of the golfers play it short and then just pitch it right on up. Now from up top side, you can see what this uh, hole looks like. You can see the magnificent trees and the dog leg that uh, curves around. The reason it gives them a problem is they don't know what to do. Do they go over the trees? If they drive it through the fairway, they're faced with a very difficult shot, a long iron shot in heavy rough of some 205 yards to the green. The interesting thing about this hole is that it has not been the most difficult, 4.52, that's .52 over par during this tournament, but that only ranks it as third toughest behind 18 and number two. But it has proved to be troublesome, but not for Lou Graham, who has the lead right now. On the third round of the tournament, he chipped it in, believe it or not, for a birdie on this most difficult hole where there was only one birdie yesterday. Here's how they've played it so far during the four rounds of the tournament. Now, Lou Graham has been using a three-wood off the tee, and John Mahaffey has been using a driver. That simply is because Mahaffey does not hit the ball quite as far, although yesterday he did drive it through the fairway. 
This gallery has picked up tremendously. I think there have been a lot of sick grandmothers around Chicago today because the crowd has almost doubled from when they started. And that ball is in the woods, and it may be in behind a tree. He hit it way left. He did not get it through, and that could cost him a very precious stroke or perhaps two strokes here because from there, there is simply no way that he can get it up on the green. He'll have to pay a little pitch out onto the fairway and then hope to get it close. But that certainly looks like a bogey coming up for Lou Graham. Uh, Bill? Yes, go ahead. Bill, you're person. mobile down there. You're walking on the fairway. Will right. you be able to get closer to that ball after John Mahaffey hits? Get a better idea? Uh, I certainly will, Jim, as soon as I can get a USGA official to clear us over to that side of the course. And here's another one in the woods. Was it going to make it? It makes it through. Mahaffey's ball just in cut the corner, and he rolls into the first cut of the rough. Not heavy at all. The ball is sitting up beautifully. And with the pin cut back on the left side today, he will have a just a perfect 205-yard shot into the green. So there is a bit of drama developing here at 13 with Lou Graham in the lead, but don't go away. We'll be back in a moment. This is Bill Fleming back at the 13th. A quick look at the leaderboard with... Uh, John Mahaffey bogeying the second hole, then Lou Graham bogeyed the third. Then he came back with back-to-back -back, uh, birdies, wound up with a 35 on the front nine, Mahaffey at 37. And then coming back on the back nine, a brilliant birdie at the 10th hole. And now he is three strokes up, and John Mahaffey will be hitting first. John Mahaffey has about, I'd say about 205 yards. He's in the, the rough, and uh, I would guess going with that two or three iron that he has used all week on this hole. John has to pick up, start picking up strokes. He is three strokes down in metal play, remember. This is not match play. And he hits a dandy right toward the flag stick. Up on the green, takes a nice little kick left. And that was a beautiful shot by John Mahaffey. Definitely in birdie territory. Now, all Lou Graham is going to be thinking about here as he is over there behind the tree with a good lie is simply pitch it out onto the fairway and then spank it on up just a perhaps a little wedge shot up onto the green. He's just aiming uh, not too close to those trees because distance isn't really important here. Position is important. There it is. He just uh, put it to face a little bit, ran it down the hill. He'll hit the upslope. You couldn't play any more strategic shot than that from where he was. And with a three-stroke lead, I'd say that was very, very well done. So Lou Graham holding this three-stroke lead over John Mahaffey, even though Mahaffey is up in birdie territory. Lou Graham gets out of his possible trouble on the 13th with a nice little pitch onto the fairway. And if he can get it close, he could, of course, uh, of course save the par here at the 13th hole. Lou Graham has been playing very, very steady golf during this playoff. Both men seem to be very relaxed at the first tee when they teed off in this first playoff in the USGA Open Championship since Jack Nicklaus at Lee Trevino played off at Marion in 71. Now there is where Graham hit his first tee shot. He just didn't quite make that corner but he got uh, a, a good break, and as you can see, pitched it right out to the base of that hill. And uh, I would say he's only, what, maybe 40 yards away from the center of the green. Now as Mahaffey walks up to the green after a very fine, what I would judge to be a three iron shot from out there onto the green, he gets a nice round of applause. And now Lou Graham will trudge up with his familiar cap on and take a look at what faces him. Uh, Dave, you, you might make a, a comment about the, the difficulty of this hole. You remember we said that Jack Nicklaus and both Kerry Middlecoff, who won here in 49, said this is the most difficult hole on the golf course. Why? Well, uh, I think because, Bill, the dog leg is actually so short. It's only 200 yards to the dog leg, and you have a hole that's over 450. And therefore, you have to lay up off the tee, which makes it play a little longer than 450 even. Uh, you hit a driver, you go through the fairway. John looked like he had a perfect drive there and still drove it to rough. Plus, your second shot, you've got a blind shot uh, that very difficult to judge when you can't see the hole, and you're always a little unsure when you've got to play a shot like that. Dave, we have a little more time than usual with only two men playing. Maybe we can get a do golf tip from you here on an uphill, kind of an extreme uphill lie like this, trying to pitch with a lofted club to a green. 
Is there a special way to do that? Well, he should play the ball back a little in his stance. If you have it uphill like that, the tendency is to hit it a little shorter simply mm -hmm. because you're putting more loft on the club. Oh, it's hard to get the ball far enough when you do that. He said a pretty good looking shot there. Kept it short as a hole. But he did, he he did leave it short, just as you said. Often happens. Well, when you swing with the contour of the ground, you're swinging up the hill. It, it makes a pitching wedge have even more loft, or it makes a nine iron have a pitching wedge loft, or whatever club you're hitting. All right, Lou Graham is up on the green, and before this round got underway, they had a chance to talk to Lou about what it means to him personally to win this Open Championship. Here's his answer. What would winning the U.S. Open mean to you, Lou? Well, it put a big smile on my face for one thing. Uh, it, it would be hard to say. Uh, it's a dream of a lifetime. I, all kids, uh, when they're starting out playing golf, are just like me, I'm sure, they thought about uh, winning the U.S. Open. How many times you stood on a putting green as a, a practice putting green as a kid and say, this putt is for the U.S. Open. I'm going to knock it in here. And you miss it or you make it and you say, I won it or I lost it. And uh, that's uh, the way the game will be played today. You either win it or you lose it out there today. But uh, if I should win, uh, it will be the greatest thing that's ever, ha ever happened to me. And if I lose, it's still the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I don't believe anybody can say it in more simple nor more eloquent words than Lou Graham said it uh, just prior to teeing off here in this playoff for the Diamond Jubilee United States Golf Association Open Championship. Lou Graham leading by three strokes in case you joined us a little bit late and they're on the 13th hole. John Mahaffey in birdieable position. Uh, Jim, I am in a, an unfortunate spot. I am down below the hole and I cannot see it. So would you mind describing these putts? Not at all. This is John Mahaffey. Should he put this in for a birdie, it would help his cause a great deal. <laughs> However, big putt there, because if John does make that putt, it puts an awful lot of pressure on looting pick up two and one, one gulp here, which he, right. needs, he needs to get something going. He, he can't just uh, let uh, Lou keep making mistakes, because Lou hasn't made very many mistakes. That's right. You know, every U.S. Open champion comes up with endorsements and things. I was noticing on that interview, Lou will probably get toothpaste <laughs> things. What a, what a set of teeth he's got. There. That's right. Well, I, I say, Jim, that, that uh, I walked around the course this morning, and the flags are no easier than they were in the first four rounds. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it'll be tough and, and you know, be, be lucky for them to play well. And I'm really pleased and surprised that they have played so well. I mean, Lou being two under, of course, he needs his butt to stay two under. Yeah. But they're really playing some good golf. Okay, so Mahaffey is down in par in this hole. Graham lies three. Remember, he was in the woods with his tee shot and had to lay out onto the fairway. So he needs this for the par, as Dave said. This putt is just at the left edge. It should fall a little bit to his right. Mm, good putt. <laughs> Ooh, that's the kind that wins U.S. Opens, isn't it? Oh, that, or anything else. That's about as much of a display of emotion as I've seen from Lou Graham on a golf course, too. He's usually a very calm guy, but you saw that clenched fist that time. Well, I'm, I'm sure John felt it, too, because you just got to be licking your chops there. He's going to pick up at least a shot. And that's why that, that is really a big swing there. That may have uh, just about crunched uh, Ben. Here are the Prince people. There. Excuse me, David. Yeah, that's all right. They're the fellows who have already qualified for next year's United States Open. Lou Graham, of course, I'm a happy. Frank Beard, who made such a magnificent effort here, as did young Ben Crenshaw. Hale Irwin made a fine defense of his title. Bob Murphy, except for a penalty on the last hole, could be in this playoff today. Jack Nicklaus might have won it, except for the bogeys in the last three holes. Peter Oosterhaus from England played magnificently in this tournament. Young Tom Watson, who led for the first two rounds. Arnold Palmer, who hung in there all the way as usual. Pat Fitzsimons, who after a hole in one on the first day at a 67 and had a good shot at it. Andy North, Ray Floyd, and the others that you see. Well, a gentleman, one of our commentators yesterday, fairly early in the going, I think, said, here comes the forgotten man, Lou Graham. Henry Longhurst, you spoke rather prophetically. Well, I made a very near thing of it, I must say, and I think if he hadn't had to wait so long with his second shot at the 18th yesterday, he would have already been champion. But still, that's a matter of opinion. Now, here's how they played it. And this hole uh, is, I think, the easiest to... This is probably the easiest or least difficult. 167 yards, 
play well over the big bunker. Little, they've got plenty of room. I have a comment from Dave Ma in a minute about whether this is the easiest, but let's watch them play it first. Just about a seven iron, and no wind, the tops of these tall trees are absolutely stationary. It's a simple, straightforward golf shot. And, after all that, he's in the trap on the left. That's just the one place I really wouldn't have thought to look for Graham's ball at this moment. An Henry, extraordinary shot. He stepped away from that tee shot. Was something bothering him? Could well, I don't know. You usually find that players as good as this, if they had a shot as bad as that in circumstances as simple as this, there's probably something that we haven't seen. It wouldn't be cameras because they're not allowed but there are things which put people off, and I can't say that there was anything which did put Graham off, but there was no reason for him to be the shot uh, quite as indifferent, may I say, as that. Seven iron. Seven iron. Now, here's his opponent with a seven iron. This is really quite a simple shot. Well, a few holes where they must have thoughts of a birdie in their mind as they hit. And he's hit one which just pitched and stopped and leaves him 30 feet from the hole. And comment from Dave Mark, I really thought that this, while the 13th may be the most difficult hole in the course, surely this is the simplest. Would you agree with that? I don't uh, question that at all, Henry. Anytime you can tee the ball up and hit a seven iron, you've got a chance to make a birdie, and we'll be back in just a moment. Now, here's the shot out of the bunker. Oh, very disappointing. It's one of that kind where they say you should just uh, clip underneath it as though it was a poached egg and, and you're trying not to break it. And he had his head up there, I'm afraid, and just fluffed it out just onto the fringe. Now, one hopes very much that this is not, I'm not taking sides, but that this isn't the beginning of a crack-up by Graham. One doesn't want to see either of them crack up. fact remains, it's almost certain that he must lose a stroke here. There's his opponent. One instinctively talks about him as an opponent, as though it was a match play affair. Of course, most of our viewers will know that it isn't a score play, but it is man to man. And everything that the other man does, the other man sees and reacts to. This is going to be about a 30-footer. Fairly simple. Short 14. A half is three behind. He's played one to his opponents. Two. keep on being critical but he doesn't want to leave himself but like that and when he has a chance of a birdie to get one out of three back then he really must make sure of reaching the hole he's still got a yard but there when you leave yourself one like that and then suddenly thoughts come into your head that maybe the other man's going to hold his from just off the green Still, it's still Graham three ahead, but looking like losing one here at the short 14th. He's two to there. 15 feet. Well, that would have been a heartbreaker if he'd have held it. So he drops a stroke to par. 
Serve and four. And Lou Graham goes back to one under par. Will remain the leader by two shots instead of three, provided that his opponent holds this one, which is by no means dead. the standings the difference now just two strokes on they go and we'll be right back they'll be playing next the 15th hole as Lou Graham at one under par holds a two-shot lead over John Mahaffey you're looking at the 15th green and the couple of acres of sand that surround it looking back up toward the tee now this is a short par four 318 yards the pen being cut very close to the front of the green and the premium shot here is put the ball on the short grass off the tee. You can see the uh, area there Keith where that the man must go everybody has gone off of this tee with an iron so far this week because you want to get the ball down on the level just before you get down the green leaving you about an 85 yard pitch to the green. Byron, yes. at this point, uh, if you were two behind, you would want the honor, I believe, wouldn't you? Just, just like John has there. If he can get up and keep putting the ball in the fairway, I think that'll put some pressure on Lou. He's got to do something to put some pressure on him. Yes, that's a very good point, David. I certainly would at this point. I would try to be, of course, head-to-head -head at this point. He must be more aggressive than what he has been. So maybe this might start him being more aggressive. He can hit this one with an iron right nicely down the fairway. And this is the last birdie opportunity, real birdie opportunity for both men. Not a long hole, the premium shot is this one. Mahaffey's tee ball started out to the right. And he has found the trees. How deep? Well, it all depends on where the ball stopped as to whether or not he has an opening. So John Mahaffey, with the honors off the tee, cannot exercise them. Now we'll see what Graham can do. Both men have played this hole in par figures all four of the previous rounds. Now, really, this should, Keith, make uh, Lou's shot a little bit easier because he almost would figure, well, all I've got to do is get down there, and now I might gain another stroke back. So uh, I think he'll be very freewheeling and very easy on this shot. He turned on his last tee ball, but he did not on this one. That is the home position right there. Couldn't drop it out of your pocket in a better position than that to have a nice pitch across these two large bunkers, the pin right there. On this pitch shot, all you need to feel to do is just drop the ball over the bunker, and then you can come within 15 feet of the hole. And the putt will not be particularly difficult if you ignore the presence of the trap and perhaps put the ball just over the trap or just beyond the pin. If you can put it down there with some bite on it, you can back it back down the hill toward the cup. There's Lou Graham's tee ball. He's in the perfect position. Mahaffey is among the wildlife. In the four rounds before this playoff started, the scoreboard reflected 74, 72, 68, and 73 for Lou Graham, 73, 71, 72, and 71 for John Mahaffey. Both very steady. If you wanted to consider the consistency of it, you would have to say that Mahaffey had been the more consistent. He was absolutely imperturbable yesterday as he literally marched out of the shadows. No one had called his name for so long. And suddenly there he was. And as I stood with him on the 18th yesterday, absolutely the most excited young man, though he did a fine job of controlling his emotions. Now, Bobby Rosberg, are you out there in the wilderness? Yes, uh, he's only about eight feet off the edge of the fairway. Uh, he's in the heavy rough. Uh, I don't believe he's got any chance of stopping the ball close to the hole. Uh, he's going to have to play a real good shot, Keith, to get it possibly 20, 25 feet past the hole. Uh, he's about 125 yards. He'll uh, probably play a nine iron, I would think. Uh, he has to hit something that he can hit hard and it will get up in the air out of the rough. He has a clean line, though. No fancy stuff involved here. Huh? 
No, it's just a normal Medina rough lie, which uh, is very fair, I believe. I think it's the fairest rough I've ever seen at the Open. John probably played a four or five iron off the tee because he's well back. He just tried to get it on top of the hill and just didn't hit it straight. Hit it the right distance, but pushed it. I think he came up, Keith, uh, off his uh, iron like he did on the last par three. He left the ball short to the right on the 14th, and it appeared to me he swung just about the same way here. He's really not releasing as John normally does so well. And certainly he is in no position to start thinking defensively. Well, it's all up to him. And his nine iron. Well, now he went through that one. He really went through that. An absolutely sensational golf shot by young John Mahaffey, 25 years of age, out of the University of Houston. You mean that's what you get when you go through it, Keith, like he didn't do off of the tee there and off the tee at the 14th. Really must swing that club through and fast in that hitting area. Ooh, now, the magic of two men head to head as Lou Graham sees the shot now must make his. It is Graham who went well beyond the pen, not Mahaffey. So if there's an advantage to be had here, it belongs to John, but he's got to hit it into the back of the cup. You figure that Graham is going to put it down into a slow motion look here. All right, now you notice what a full extension he gets here, real high, because when you're in the rough, you really must hit down and through. And we'll see what a great full extension he did, how much he used his body, shoulders, and arms to just lift that ball out of the rough. And that's why he had such a great shot. John Mahaffey and Lou Graham both had reflections prior to the start of this playoff round. Let's spend a moment with John Mahaffey. John, I know that our director, Terry Jastrow, who roomed with you at the University of Houston, has told us so many times of your dedication to this game. He said, even when the other guys might go out for a couple of beers or go to the movies, you might stay home and work on your grips a little bit or uh, just check things out or put on the rug. Can you put into words what this day could mean to you? Well, it uh, would mean the fulfillment of a dream for me. I've always wanted to be a, a factor in a major tournament, and now I am. And there's so much tradition around the U.S. Open, and and just to, to have your name on the on the uh, trophy and just to win the golf tournament I don't care what the money is I just want to win this golf tournament so bad it's I, I really can't put into words what it would mean to me but it would just be the thrill of a lifetime the thrill of a lifetime they're so few and so elusive they certainly are Keith and it is a thrill of a lifetime to win this great championship and it is never easy to win and when you get in a playoff you sometimes feel like you've been out here forever. You come here and practice, and then you play four rounds, and then you find yourself still out there playing. These fellows have done a remarkable job of concentrating and playing as well as they have today because it's hard not to get a letdown after the tournament is actually over as far as the 72 holes are concerned. Of course, it isn't over for them till the day is over, but uh, you kind of gear yourself for the 72 holes, and then you find yourself you must still stay up for another round. And, Sometimes that is very difficult to do, but both these boys have done a real job of that today. They're playing very well. The course has been set up, as David said earlier. I think that I walked the entire course. I think it's set up more difficult today than it was the other day. Now you see Lou with John there watching what he does. You know, it's a hard thing not to play too much what your opponent does on a day like today. Lou has a pretty long putt here, uh, but... This is the kind he just wants to roll close to the hole, even though Mahaffey is down there with a possible chance for a birdie. That looks the better part of 35 feet to me. Maybe 38. Tender. Yes, it's downhill, and he didn't hit, I'm sure, that he would like to roll that one again. Now you can see there Mahaffey has a good chance. He picked up a stroke on the last hole. Now he has... Keith, another opportunity to pick up one more here. I walked around and around and around that thing today, and I really don't think John will get all that much break. It might be uh, easy to read too much into it and go a little bit uh, to the high side or to the right side. I figure the ball's going to work very much. It probably could work a little right-left. But then uh, it's the proper, been very hot with the, proper, today. with the proper speed, I don't I think you're right. I don't think it has very much break at all with the proper speed. And uh, John isn't 
normally rolls the ball quite well on the green. He has not putted quite as well today as what his normal putting is, and uh, I would say that he would probably feel I'm about due to make one right now. From 18. Oh. Well, he didn't. He read it the other way. He didn't give it quite enough, and perhaps he might have pulled it just a bit, so he pulls it to the low side of the hole and has this tap in to make par at 15. And remain one over par in today's playoff round, two shots back of Lou Graham. But Graham must get this one down to save par. And not many birdies from here to the clubhouse, though, I'll tell you. A man would love to feel that he could finish 4-3-4. Four, four. You'd pick up ground instead of losing ground on anybody. There is that. a career in trauma available to anybody from here to the clubhouse. Lou has been very steady with these all, way, all week. He's been smooth and slow, keeps the putter low. Winning the top edge, rather firm putt on 15, and so the match remains. Graham at one under, my happy one over in the playoff for the U.S. Open Championship. You know, uh, it may be of interest yet before this is over that John Mahaffey has parred every hole except one. He had one bogey. Let's take a look at this next hole. And this is the 16th hole, the graveyard of many hopes so far in this championship. 452 yards, dog leg, from left to right, fairway sloping from left to right, tree lined, not one single bunker on this hole. A lake down below the right-hand side of the green, which really hasn't come into play at all this week because the wind has mostly been behind. But today the pin is cut on the front left position. It's about seven o'clock as you come onto the green. Very difficult. There it is. So unless anyone can put their tee shot down on the right side of the fairway as they come down, they're going to have a very, very difficult second shot indeed. Wind's behind, blowing from the south. But they've played this hole pretty well so far. You see, all of them have scored, or rather both of them have scored fours every time. Wind's helping. Must get down the right, right of centre from the tee. This is where Jack Nicholas ruined his hopes really yesterday by driving way into the trees on the left and dropped a stroke. Overclubbed at the 17th and dropped another one, put it in the bunker at the 18th. And he, like so many, went home to roost. This is Mahaffey, still in with a chance by Joe. It's not over yet. He can get a par finish. Well, he's asking it to fade, but it doesn't, and it goes up in the rough on the top side, and that is just the place not to be. Graham playing very well indeed. We only saw that one pulled tee shot at the 14th where he got a little bit tight and restricted in the follow through, hoiked it round in the bunker. Let's see how he shapes up to this one. Well, that looked a very smooth, confident swing indeed. And it sails down the fairway, coming off the slope, down the right half in absolutely the perfect position. Beautiful shot from Lou Graham. Mahaffey away in the rough on the left. Join us in a moment. And we're back at the 16th. View from behind the green going back down the fairway. John Mahaffey having hit his tee shot into the rough on the left-hand side. And let's have a look at that swing in slow motion. Hands a bit low at the address, which is interesting position, but he gets a good 
turn. He's not a tall man, only five foot nine. Club just beyond the horizontal, just flicking beyond the horizontal. Legs forward, hits it now, bringing the hands in, hitting the ball with the club head. A lot of you at home, I think, always forget that you hit the ball with the club head. Sends it through and on its way, just round a little bit. Looked pretty good. I think he more or less hit it down the left-hand side. But from where he is, it certainly looks uh, not the good place to be. Bob Rosberg's down on the on the fairway. How's it look from your end, Bob? It looks difficult from here. Peter, he doesn't really have too bad a lie. But uh, not only was the drive crooked, but it was a very weak drive. He's got about 215 yards left. He's going to have to hit a two or three iron. With a pin where it is, it's almost impossible to get the ball close to the hole. made a good contact but that's going into the rough on the left it's bouncing pretty well through the rough but it stops about 10 10 or 12 yards short of the putting surface and it's settled down in that grass which is about two or three inches long leaving him a very awkward little chip shot so a great chance here for Lou Graham here he is he hit the perfect drive he must be at least 50 or 60 yards ahead of Mahaffey Here's another look from behind the slow motion. No sign of the ball, and of course, with a straight face club, very, very difficult to get uh, solid contact. But he tried hard enough. The ball just dragged away behind the trees ahead of him. There it comes. Nearly played the miracle shot of the year, but uh, here now is Lou Graham. At 170 yards, 160 yards to the flag. If that's the right length, it's perfect. Magnificent stroke. Cool, calm and collected. Dead on line. Only eight or nine paces from the flag. Very cool customer. Let's have a look at that again. Off the uh, slope, you see the ball below the feet. Always rather difficult. You must make sure to make a good, solid contact. What a nice position there. Legs nicely relaxed but firm. Down she comes, head still, look at that. Right down in behind the ball and just punched forward. Nice, neat finish. And there's the result. Beautifully played shot. And who knows what might be in store for this man, should he just hold on and indeed become champion. He's a couple ahead at the moment. Peter, how do you think his game might be suited to Carnoustie should he decide to come play in the British Open? Well, he certainly plays a very calm game, Jim, and, uh, and a, as an infrequent observer of your players, on, certainly on this side of uh, the, the pond, as we say, I am amazed that he has not won many more championships. You've seen how coolly he holds the putts. He hits the drive down the fairway. He's played some... Uh, super irons into the green and uh, perhaps this may be the start uh, we've seen many players over the years be late developers indeed perhaps one might even say the mighty ben hogan was a relatively late developer getting into his 30s really before uh, he started winning many major championships and then of course the motor accident slowed him down but who knows what will happen and that's uh, our little plan of the 16th hole and you see mahaffey left from the tee and now he's up short of the green, sitting down in the grass. Awkward little chip shot. Well, he certainly didn't hold back on it. He got a good length of backswing, but just had to chop at it a little too fiercely. And he's gone, well, perhaps 10 feet past. course again in good condition although our, we had heavy rains again last night thunder this is Graham now just watch how calm and cool he seems to be remember this is as many have said before perhaps the greatest championship of the four great championships that are now called the modern Grand Slam look how cool and calmly he strolls about We'll watch how smoothly he swings the putter. There's no sign of edginess. There certainly hasn't been so far in the holes we've seen today. He's 
been in the driving seat really all the way from the second hole where he picked up his first stroke. That interesting shoulder and arm shuffle as he gets himself into position. Well, it was online, but that's two and a half feet short. There you can see all sorts of possibilities and excitements creep into golf. There we had a situation three or four minutes ago where it looked as if young John Mahaffey were almost certain to lose a stroke, and now he is given a slight little breath of extra life if he can hold this he's 10 or 11 feet away he's got to hold it and graham's got to miss but uh, all the time it's pressure building up be a great cheer if this one goes in very firm putting action it's well down the shaft right thumb almost on the grip just didn't have the pace with it to carry it on. It swung away, and he's gone a foot past. So a great buffer again here for Graham. He can miss it and still remain two ahead. This to go three ahead. with just perhaps two or three beads of perspiration thrown in with that little one, but uh, nevertheless, that's his fifth par at this hole in five goes. Now Mahaffey, this for a one over, par five. We'll go to Jim McKay. All right, Peter, and have a pleasant journey home. If we don't talk to you again, we'll see you at Carnoustie. We had Dave Marr, ABC's resident golf professional, go out to the screen earlier and demonstrate the problems of this hole. The 17th at Madonna is a super par 3, 225 yards long. You tee off back the hill there, so because you're teeing off from an uphill down to a downhill, it doesn't play quite as long, about 210 yards, maybe a 2-iron or a 3-iron. But once you've gotten over the lake, past these sand traps, this sand trap rather is just in front and missed the traps that are around the green, your problems are still not over. The green here is a very undulating green. If you're not in the front part of it, your problems have just begun. Now, we'll take a look at it on our graphics, and for those of you that are watching in color, it's marked in red. From the bottom putting up to the hole, that's your most makeable times. But right, left, or past the flag, your troubles have just begun here at 17. Now, if you haven't hit it in the perfect area, which we just showed you short of the hole there, and you've hit a good shot, you know, this is just a little past hole high on the right, or if you were a little past hole high on the left, your problems here are that this green is so slick and so much break to it, your problem here is to get the right speed, not so much the right break. You know it's going to break from this point right to left to the other side, just the opposite. Problem here is speed. The ball will break anywhere from three to four, maybe five feet, depending on how hard you hit it. Why don't we just take a look at this putt here? I'm going to try to play it about four feet up to the right of the hole and just touch the ball. And that's not too bad. That's no cinch three, but I, I, I would certainly take that one. I'm sure that when a player hit a shot like this, he was very satisfied as it left his club back at the tee. The problem is here, he's hit one too many clubs, and he's by the flag about 20 or 25 feet. Now your problem begins here at 17 green. This might be the slickest green on the course, though, because of the rain, it's not quite as fast or as quick as I'm sure the USGA and the members of Medina wanted. The player's problem from here is don't let the putt get away from you. You have no opportunity to take a run at this for a birdie. Problem, you've got to be sure that it's the right speed down the hill. Not too much break. Okay, well, here they are actually playing the hole. This is Lou Graham with his tee shot to the 17th in the playoff right now. And as you see, it's in the back. It's got a 
good lie from this pass back there, but it's still going to be kind of a problem shot. Yeah, but the main thing there, Jim, with the three-shot lead is, is for Lou to put the ball over the water. Now, he's uh, got himself in, in super position here. You, you've got to figure that uh, John, he hasn't made a birdie all day. It doesn't look like he's going to make one. If, if Lou can just go 4-4 four, four or 4-5, four, he will be the 75th U.S. Open champion. You know, I didn't tell John, but I did look up his horoscope in the paper this morning. You know what it said? Stay at home base rather than chase after elusive rewards, I swear. Well, he couldn't do that. Crowd seem to think that's a good shot. Let's see if their judgment is correct. Well, he's a, that is a good shot. Looks he's, like he's pretty much in the area where you illustrated that you want to go. That's right. So it's it's still, uh, he hasn't made a birdie all day, so maybe this will be uh, John's time, and he certainly needs it right now. And certainly a bogey is not out of the question for his opponent. We'll be right back. We're back again at Medina, 18-hole playoff for the U.S. Open Championship. And it is Lou Graham against John Mahaffey. They're on the 17th hole, Lou Graham, with a three-shot lead at the moment. Something must happen quickly or Mahaffey's hopes have, will disappear. However, Graham is off the green. He's going to be coming down at this hole. Mahaffey, with his tee shot, is not only on the green, but in a very good putting position. Graham, however, has been very unshakable ever since he started this tournament last Thursday. He's had rounds of 74, 72, 68, and 73 yesterday. The one thing in his favor here, Jim, is it looks as though he's got a very good lie, and that's what you need here. Going down this hill, it is very slick, and if he could get it up there real close, it would really uh, hurt John's chances. Of course, if he doesn't get it close, John has a chance to pick up two shots here if he can make that birdie putt. That's right, an 18. Certainly, you can see a one-stroke swing, and that's what the problem is and the danger that you explained, Dave. From up there, it's just so slick, so fast, that if you... Don't hit it at least that hard. You're allowed to leave it back in the grass there, as Jack Nicklaus did yesterday. Right. You just, uh, you've almost got to miss the shot in order to get it close. If you hit it what you think is the right speed, it's just got to go six or eight feet by the hole. All right. Now, should Mahaffey make this putt and Graham miss, we would have a two-shot swing, and they would go to the 18th tee with one shot between them. And 18 has proved an extremely difficult hole all week to these professionals. So... You had might as well stay with us if you've been with us <laughs> this long, long, thunderous weekend in Chicago. If John's thinking good, Jim, he's got to feel like, look, this, I'm not going to let the course shut me out today. I haven't made a birdie, and I've hit this real good shot in here, and it's about time I did something. And if he was ever going to get one to the hole, he's left a few of them a little bit short there. If he's ever going to get one to the hole, now is the time to hit it. No question break a little right to left. I know we saw that as Lou's ball came from the opposite angle down the hill. Mm -hmm. All day long, he's been leaving it just a little weak. Well, I know that was the last thing that was in his mind is that he was going to leave it short. If he had hit that just uh, about a foot longer, I think he would have held the line and he may have made it. Lou Graham, if he can get down in one from here, it seems unlikely, would have things wrapped up. If well, he gets it, down in two, he'll still have a two-shot lead, however. Right, it w and with a two-shot lead, the uh, 18th I don't think is quite as dangerous as 17. Uh, Lou would have to make a bogey and John a birdie to pick up two shots, but it may not even be two. If Lou happens to hold this, he'll have a three-shot lead. And Lou did, in fact, bogey 18 yesterday. As about everyone else did. <laughs> Just on the right edge, the ball should break a little right to left. Of such fractions of inches are U.S. Open championships made. So it's a bogey four for Lou Graham, a par for John Mahaffey. The difference is two shots with one hole left to play. That'll be coming right up. All right, here we are taking a look at the 18th hole at Medina. This is where it's going to end very shortly. It's a good hole, Jim. Par four, dog leg to the right. And as John Marshall, the pro here at Medina, said, the guys just don't realize how big a dog leg that is. They'll try to cut it around that corner, but generally when they've used woods, they've knocked it right through the fairway into the left rough, and uh, it's a small green to be hitting out, out of this rough. 
John Mahaffey told us before he went out that no question he'd be hitting a two iron off this tee. Let's see. As they come to this tee, we would like to thank, we'll probably be going off the air very quickly. The greenskeeper here, John Jakeman, club manager, Bert Hams, the assistant manager, Bob Nelson, the tournament manager for the USGA, Nancy Jupp, the general chairman, Donald M. Stilwa, and the golf pro that you mentioned, John Marshall. Everybody really has been more than normally cooperative with us here, and we're most appreciative. So, John, I said, if you have the honor coming to 18, what are you going to use? He said two iron before I finished the question, and I think that's what he has in his hand. Well, he's definitely got an iron. I am a little surprised, uh, though I think when he makes his mind up, he's got his game plan, he's going to stick with it. I, I thought maybe he might try a driver and slide it around there and see if he could put any heat on Lou, but sticking right to his plan. Yep. hear that uh, jet going over as he swung and he's hit it just in perfect yep. position yep. Jim. fine shot we will be hearing jets in our sleep for at least a week <laughs> they've been coming over every 45 seconds during this tournament we are of course directly in the landing and takeoff pattern for o'hare international airport now back to the tee and the man who can win the u.s open at age 37 if he can get a par here possibly even with a bogey and it couldn't happen to a nice guy. Uh oh. Well, I'm, I think he probably kept a little left from the way he's looking there, and it's up into the left rough somewhere. Look out! What happens in the U.S. Open all the time? What happened here yesterday could be happening again with the Open Championship almost literally in the palm of his hand. Lou Graham has gone into the woods on the left. Let's let's give Bob Rosberg a moment to get out there, but he's going to have a big problem, I think. Stay with us. We'll be back. We're back at the playoff for the U.S. Open Championship. Jim McKay at our anchor position with Dave Marr. And Lou Graham, literally within sight of the championship, has gotten into tr trouble. How deep it is, we'll be able to tell in a moment. He pulled his tee shot fairly deep into the left rough. As you see, people gathered around down in there. He could have a problem with a tree. Yesterday, Bob Murphy had to take an unplayable lie here. That's the general area where he's gone. I don't know what kind of, or if he's got any kind of shot out to the uh, fairway or not. I I'm just don't think as deep as it looks there that he's going to have any way to get to the green. And Bob Rossberg is uh, in the area. Rossi, what's, what's Lou's uh, deal there? Bob Rossberg, can you hear us? It may be we have a little electronic problem Here's with Bob. Bob. However, you see the lie there. The oh, there you are. going to go out of bounds. Say again, Bob. The ball that... Lou Graham hit off the tee, if it did not hit somebody, would have been out of bounds. It is only about eight feet from out of bounds. He has no shot at all except to pitch it out. But if it had not hit anybody, the ground is very hard over there, and I believe the ball would have been out of bounds. Well, so the ball hit someone in the gallery, which I believe is defined as an outside agency. It's a rub of the green, so to speak. And I think you heard uh, Bob Rossberger, though the transmission was a little weak, so we'll repeat it say that if it had not hit someone in the gallery it would have been out of bounds and this would have been a different championship playoff it still may be it is impossible according to bob for him to get to the green that means he's going to be on in three uh quite possibly make bogey but that still means that john mahaffey here would have to make birdie to tie it up if he should tie it up we will see the first sudden death playoff in the history of the U.S. Open. The rule was changed within recent years. It has not yet come into effect. They would go to the first hole, and even now, cameramen are rushing over with cables, microphones. And what a tired bunch of guys we're going to have on our technical crew when this is finally over. What a job they've done. Rossi, what kind of club do you think he may be using there? I would think he'd just be pitching it out, Dave, with perhaps a seven or eight iron. He's got to keep it under the tree, but take enough loss. Mm -hmm. He hit it pretty hard. I tell you what, he played a very brave shot. Boy, he, hit, he played a very good shot. Look yep. at this. It's almost coming to the green, Bob. That's unbelievable. I tell you, I cannot believe that he even tried that shot. <laughs> well, I tell you, that was some shot. I, I look for him just to chip it out like you did, and it's up here right by the green. So he is certainly within position to possibly chip it up close enough for the, the uh, par. However, that is not assured. He's still not on the putting surface. Let's see how close John Mahaffey gets. He must get the birdie here to have a chance to tie and force it into sudden death. The sun comes out for the first time in hours. 
It's a good looking shot if it's not too long. He said it just to the right of the hole, Jim. And, and as you pointed out, that is a real fine golf shot Ooh. there. And that's going to put a little heat on Lou because he, it's just all day, John. It's been very close to the hole. And just as I thought this morning, it's a very even match. There really wasn't any clear cut favorite. They both play a lot alike, they're very steady. And it's turning out there's only going to be a shot difference between the two of them, it looks like. Well, John Mahaffey, as we say, has at least an opportunity for this birdie, but it's a long putt, and that hole is going to look about the size of a dime to him. Well, so, if uh, John doesn't get this into the hole, I know he want to slash his wrist here if he left it short there at 17. You want to know what Graham's horoscope was today? What? Lou Graham says, coping with ordinary work plus today's added concerns is difficult enough. Don't expect allowances for individual ventures. <laughs> Well, there they come with Sandy Tatum, the chairman of the championship committee of the USA between them, smoking the pipe for the 18th screen. And a really quite good gallery for a Monday, a working day has turned out here. And yet, still, it kind of reminds you of the old days of golf, doesn't it, Dave? Still a, a gallery that's within controllable size that kind of strolls along with the players and just two men head to head. Yeah, they've, they've been good here all week. You can hear the hand that the people are giving them because they really have both played very well today, and I was really hoping for that, that you wouldn't have a playoff where one would shoot 78 and one would shoot 79. I think that would take away a little of the luster of winning the prize. But it's not over, James, because uh, there's no, Lou has no sense to get that in two, and John has a very makeable putt. Right now, the gallery, by the way, looks very much like the traditional uh, British Open finish. They always let the gallery come around behind, or in, in front of the green, and make, make an absolute ring. Where they stand is a two-shot difference. Lou Graham, if he can get down to two from there, will have an even par round of 71. John Mahaffey, should he make par, will have 73. Should he make the birdie, would have 72. But the question is, who will have the U.S. Open title? He's about 75 feet from the flag, and he shouldn't have too much of a problem, Jim. Uh, his lie looks good. He's got a lofted club there, probably uh, eight iron, seven, eight iron. Just needs to loft it about uh, 10, 15 feet on the green and just let it run up. Okay, well, we're really going to have about a mole's eye view of this. Watch it running up there. And he's hit a very, very fast well, shot. However, he's hit it far enough past that the probability would be that he would make Bogey here. Right. But the pressure's on John. If John doesn't make it, it's all over. That's right. Certainly, Lou Graham should be able to get down in two from here. And that means that Mahaffey must make this putt to tie for the tournament or to potentially tie for the tournament. I'm sure uh, a lot of people at the champions today are <laughs> pulling for little John to get this one in there. That's right. He used to work for... Your cousin Jack Burke and Jimmy DeMarit down there, didn't he? That's right. He keeps playing like this. They'll be working for him. <laughs> it was there that Ben Hogan first spotted him, played a practice round with him, as I recall, and said, young man, I'd like to play again with you tomorrow. Yeah. And all the years of preparation, all those nights that he stayed home in the dorm while the other guys were out someplace, thinking about his game, working on his clubs, have come to this for John Mahaffey at age 27. Well, it comes down to what Lou Graham said a moment ago. You, when you're a little kid, you have these putts on the green and you say, I'm going to make this for the U.S. Open or the PGA or whatever, and all of a sudden you got it right here. I've got to make this to have a chance to win the U.S. Open. Fairly straight, Jim. It shouldn't break too much. Oh, He's going up this time. Well, the ball moved out to the right. I was very surprised that the ball moved that way, and he did hit a very good putt. Problem, he just, he never made a birdie all day, and that, uh, that kills you in a situation like this. He will tap it in. Well, he's going to mark. Well, since this is not quite over, I suppose, he just soon have the moment to get himself together and make sure of that final putt. Yes, it, uh, you don't know what may happen. He, uh, I'm a little surprised he didn't go ahead and putt out. Because That's what I was Lou, wondering, yeah. Yeah, Lou has two putts to win, and yeah. uh, if Lou makes, the gallery, of course, will applaud. And It, it doesn't matter money-wise. I mean, John yeah. finishes second, and 
Certainly wouldn't cost him anything if he happened to miss a little when he's got left. Just a little match play psychology, maybe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's the way to win the U.S. Open. That's right. With the par four after a disastrous tee shot in the final hole, Lou Graham is the United States Open golf champion for 1976. After 90 long holes, a hug for the young man who has carried the bag all that <laughs> sweaty, long, hot way. Yeah. And I bet he's stunned right now, right? Oh, you don't you, know where you are, do you? No, you really don't. You don't know what to say. You know you're going to have to make a speech. Look at him. And he's, Jim, he is really one of the nice guys on the tour. You never hear Lou complain about the bad breaks or anything. And, and here he's won the greatest prize of his life. I'm sure the greatest day of his professional life. Greatest prize in golf, the National Open Championship, the U.S. Open for Lou Graham. $40,000 the first prize, $20,000 for John Mahaffey. But both of them said, and they said it sincerely, that in this one case, the money's great, but it doesn't really mean that much. It's the title that counts. Well, there's no question about that. Your name goes up on the trophy there with uh, just the people we had at the top of the show, whether it's Byron and Hogan and all those guys. There he is being congratulated by our own Bill Fleming. Ground transportation provided by Chevrolet Motor Division. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. Come catch the spirit with United and Arnie Palmer with great golf vacation throughout your land. This is Jim McKay with Dave Marr and all our other six commentators. We've had a wonderful weekend here. The winner is Lou Graham. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.